Good evening and welcome to the May 14th, 2015 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and we'll begin by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Ms. Blue Duvall. Present. Ms. Laura Cowan. Present. Ms. Pam Present. Ms. Ann Hensley. Present. Mr. Danny Meyer. Here. Mr. Howard Moore. Here. Mr. Here. Mr. Present. Present. Excellent. The um, first item on our agenda is the public comment period. And uh, we ask that uh, folks who wish to speak in co uh, public comment step to the microphone and say their name and address uh, for the record. Um, and we ask you to limit your remarks to three minutes. Um, we have one person who's signed up, and that is Jeremy Whalen. Hello, my name is Jeremy Whalen. I live at 214 Pomeroy Lane in Amherst, uh, Massachusetts. I'm also a teacher in the tech department at the high school. Uh, today I had uh, the pleasure of having Chris Heber, who was a representative from the uh, Department of Education Office of uh, Digital Learning, come into my classroom. Uh, we have been using in my uh, architectural design, tech drawing, and advanced drawing uh, SketchUp Pro 2015, which is a 3D modeling program. Uh, so he came in and he saw, he was asking questions and said, you know, what could we do to improve uh, your, ex your students' experience with the software and how can we, how can we better help you? And uh, this kind of rings true to what I said at the, uh, the, the Budget Commission hearings, uh, I basically looked at him and I said, you know, computers, technology, hardware. Uh, I, I liken it to having a, you know, all expense paid trip to Hawaii, but not having the plane to get there. Uh, so we have at our disposal thousands and thousands of dollars worth of uh, Autodesk programs, really professional grade uh, uh, software um, that parents call me and say, what is the next logical step for my for my child to succeed in architecture or engineering or design. And I say, you know, it's these Autodesk programs. Uh, by the way, here's how you can get a license to install it on your home computer. We can't, we can't uh, put it on our computers because we don't have the, capac the, the processing speeds and capacity on our computers uh, to run this. Uh, I, I don't think that's fair to the, the, the students, uh, both at home and their parents, but also the, the uh, underprivileged and low-income students. Uh, they should be able to, uh, and I have a lot of them in my class after school working on their projects and waiting for uh, what we call the pinwheel of death on a Mac, it's that little rainbow, to stop uh, rotating for two minutes after they change their perspective on a uh, on their uh, three-dimensional designs. Uh, they have the wherewithal to sit there, but it's frustrating for them, and it's, and it's, uh, it's inefficient both in the classroom uh, and for their futures. And I would love to see the district uh, really prioritize uh, not only uh, the technology, but also see innovative ways in which we can uh, save on costs or be more efficient. I'll give you an example. We had, I took my, uh, some of my uh, department uh, funds, and thanks to Angelo, thanks to Candace, thanks to Donna Lawrence, thanks to Kim Broussard, uh, thanks to Brian Lombardi, we all got together. I worked with uh, several students to spec out computers, and take the parts, build five computers for $420 that perform at the $800 to $900 range. But these students stayed after, they, they, they knew the specs, they, they built these computers, installed the operating systems, they had an educational component to it, and it saved about 50% on those builds. That was five computers, we could do it with 50, we could do it with 100. But we need to come together and, and, and find kind of innovative ways to, to accomplish this. I'm more than willing to help. I have an, a kind of army of students that's uh, dedicated to this, they're passionate about it, they want to see these computers be built, they want to see these new technologies being implemented, and uh, I would say please reach out to me, please reach out to, to Angelo and, and everybody that's involved here because everybody wants to see our, our students have all of the, um, you know, reach that full potential and please prioritize uh, the technology uh, for our districts. Thank you. Is there anyone else who uh, wishes to speak as part of the public comment session? 
Okay, hearing none, we'll move on. Are there any announcements from the city council members? The How about the school, school committee? I'm sorry. I just, I'm sorry. I just, just came from a. That was a long time ago. I just came from a city council meeting, so I have a city council related meeting, so I have city council on the brain. School committee members, sorry. I do. Okay. Okay. Um, I wanted to um, say that I attended the other night Dollars for Scholars, and 126 students received scholarships, and the board wanted me to remind students that not only is Dollars for Scholars good for their senior year, but to please apply for the following three years. And I told them I would state that, so I did. The other thing, um, tomorrow evening at the middle school, uh, well actually 4.30 to 6, there's an opening reception of a sampling of original artworks by kindergarten through eight students. And there will be light refreshments provided by the PTO. And the art show will be on display until June 5th. So um, everyone's welcome to come to that. And only other thing is, the technology. I went on Saturday, the Invent team had a fundraiser and it was an awesome, awesome experience. And unfortunately, it was also an awesome, awesome day. So hardly anyone attended. And um, if they do have it again, I would urge everyone to go. I had so much fun. Had there been kids there, they probably wouldn't have let me do as much as I did. But it was just incredible. Um, I really learned the excitement for science that, <laughs> that day. And um, the police were there and everything. So just invite people to look out for that and to help support the invent team so that they can go in June and give their self-feathering or a chance. Thank you very much. Any other announcements? I have one. Okay. Mr. Moore. Which is that um, the Bridge Street School 100th anniversary celebration is Friday, May 29th from 3 to 5 at the Bridge Street School playground. It's going to be fun. Um, any other announcements from school committee members or any city councilors that might be here? <laughs> <laughs> or students. Okay. Uh, okay, so we will move on to um, the recommended actions, and we have a consent agenda that includes the approval of minutes of the school committee meeting of April 9th. We have a contract uh, with for Heinemann Literacy Instructional Materials for $36,331.77. And we have uh, four field trip requests, the eighth grade reading students going to High Meadow, uh, Granby, Connecticut, June 8, 2015. The boys and girls track going to the Northeast Interscholastic Outdoor Track and Field Championships in Saco, Maine, June 13, 2015. Ryan Road fifth graders are going to the Connecticut Science Center, Hartford, Connecticut, June 17, 2015. And the boys and girls track are going to the New Balance Outdoor Nationals in Greensboro, North Carolina, June 18 through the 22nd, 2015. Move to approve the Second. consent agenda. Okay, there's been a motion made and seconded to approve these items as part of the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the consent agenda is adopted unanimously. Now we move to reports and recommendations, and we are joined uh, by our student, one of our student representatives, uh, Jonathan Latender. Uh, must be getting down to the, the final, uh, final meetings here um, as the school year winds down, but I'll turn the floor over to you for your report. Thank you, Mayor. But yeah, sadly, it's probably gonna be my last uh, meeting uh, for the year as I graduate next month. Um, but uh, speaking of graduating, uh, the year is uh, wrapping up and seniors' last day of classes is uh, the 27th of May with uh, exams being held on the 28th and 29th. Um, senior day to uh, High Meadows is May 26th um, and the senior events this year include uh, the 28th, May 28th is uh, Senior Awards Night at 6.30 p.m. Um, the uh, Senior Prom, which is June 1st at the Log Cabin. Uh, Wednesday, June 3rd is the Senior Family Picnic at 5.30 at NHS, and it gets over about roughly 7.30. Um, family members and friends are encouraged to come. Hamburgers, hot dogs, and veggie burgers will be provided by the school, and the family brings uh, the side dishes. Uh, June 5th is the Senior Breakfast for seniors only. Uh, they receive their caps and gowns, graduation tickets, and can request more if they need to. Rehearsal is from 10.30 to 12, and it's mandatory. Graduation is Sunday, June 7th, from 3 till 5.30. Um, 
seniors need to be there for 2 p.m. Student elections for class officers for remaining classes to be held in um, our for the remaining classes are being held in June. Uh, grade 8 visit uh, from JFK is uh, June 10th. Students will tour the school and get a little gist of um, what's to come for them in, in their freshman year um, and get a gist of the academics and sports that they could be doing. They will also be back um, in the summer uh, for the orientation um, like they did last year. Mm. Career day for freshmen is uh, June 16th. Um, math MCAS for sophomores will be held May 19th and 20th. Um, this creates a late start for all other grades. Senior capstone fair day will be um, May 20th, I believe. Um, it's uh, the capstone project was a senior. It's a senior portfolio that um, each senior that took it. Um, learned in their uh, learned in their years and what they highlighted out of it um, and their years of high school. The film festival will be held uh, Thursday, June 4th and the last full day of school will be June 19th with exams on the 22nd and 23rd and the final day which will be a half day will be June 24th. That completes my uh, school report and I just wanted to personally thank everybody for uh, letting me do it this year. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. We appreciate your service as well, and congratulations on your graduation. Thank you so much, Mayor. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next item on the agenda, um, I have a proclamation uh, that I'll be issuing, and um, it's actually in honor of a of a holiday that occurred uh, earlier in the month of May, but obviously fell between our two meetings. Um, it's a proclamation uh, entitled "School Lunch Hero Day," uh, and actually we've got some great sort of school lunch hero graphics on the proclamation, <laughs> which are kind of cute. Um, very schoolhouse rock looking. Uh, whereas nutritious meals at school are an essential part of the school day, and whereas the staff of the district's school meals and nutrition department are committed to providing healthful, nutritious meals to the district's children, and whereas the school nutrition professionals find creative ways to improve menus and get students excited about healthier choices, and whereas the men and women who prepare and serve school meals help nurture our children through their daily interaction and support, and whereas the day Friday, May 1st, 2015 is School Lunch Hero Day, now therefore I, uh, Mayor David Narkowitz, to hereby proclaim uh, retroactively uh, May 1st to be School Lunch Hero Day in the city of Northampton. The Northampton School District expresses its deep appreciation to these valuable employees and commends their good work on behalf of children. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and have imprinted the city seal this 23rd day of April 2015. And I note that uh, Carol tomorrow, our school on, um, uh, present this to you. In service to the coordinator, Thank director. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Say a few words, please do. Uh, uh, this is Carolyn Mazzillo. She's one of my managers from Ryan Road School. And one of my other employees is back there with her little one, Barbara Warren. Um, I cannot thank all the staff for the outpouring of support from my cafeteria staff. I know it brought tears to their eyes. Um, excuse me, things like um, the cards made out of um, uh, construction paper. I cannot tell you how many tears were shed over those. It was absolutely wonderful, and I want to thank the whole district for their support of our department. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the um, next item on the agenda, um, we have uh, a series of votes. Um, uh, the first is a vote regarding some athletic department gifts. Uh, and there are five of them uh, combined uh, for the athletic department boys soccer Hi, boosters for Josh, please call the pool office. Joshua, please call the pool office. Thank you. 
uh, boys soccer boosters for equipment, boys lacrosse boosters for an assistant coach stipend, athletic booster club, uh, softball uniforms, athletic booster club for ultimate frisbee uniforms, uh, and the paint night fundraiser proceeds for boys lacrosse. And I'll turn this over to the superintendent. Thank you. Just to add a little more detail to the gifts that we'll be asking for a vote on, the first is from the North Northampton Boys Soccer Boosters to Northampton to the district. Um, it includes 24 practice balls, 24 game balls, 24 home and away jerseys, and 20 fair, 24 pairs of shorts. The next is from the Northampton Boys Lacrosse Boosters. It's a gift in the amount of $2,460 for the payment of an assistant coach. The next is from the NABC. It's $2,075. It's a gift awarded to the softball team to pay for new uniforms. The next from the NABC, a gift of $2,085.40. It's a gift to pay for new Ultimate Frisbee uniforms. And um, the proceeds from the uh, Art Night for Boys Lacrosse is in the amount of $465. Okay. I'd like to move to accept the athletic department gifts with gratitude. Second. Okay. Uh, Ms. Minnick. I just have one question or comment maybe about the gift that's being used to pay for an assistant coach. It concerns me a little bit that we're using um, an even income stream to cover a position. I'm okay with it for one year. Is that position going to be built into our, I, it's, I mean, I understand that it's really, there's no difference, supposedly it's all expenses, but, but I would rather see us collecting money to pay for uniforms than I would be, well, even while, while I think that the district should be providing uniforms, I think we all agree to that, but since we can't, I appreciate very much the booster clubs stepping up and doing this, but I am concerned about looking to fund an ongoing position with a, with a potentially um, not endless income stream. Sure. So, so just it has, has the um, finance director looked at that? And, I mean, will this? If you uh, reference the athletic budget section of your FY16 budget book, you'll see that the costs for the individual sports are laid out and the amount that is to be funded by the district and the <laughs> amount that we're looking for for boosters from. So there are budgets and there are positions in next year's budget that we're looking for boosters to support. Um, but we did increase substantially the amount of funding for the overall athletic program. Any other questions? Did we um, increase it substantially or did we just kind of, I, I thought that it was, that we just made it realistic as far as by the end of the year we spent the money. So we didn't really, I mean we increased it obviously, but just to cover what we were already pretty much spending, wasn't, was that more? Well, that, that is true. Um, however, we were in a position essentially of deficit spending in the athletic program before. Um, and in, in that case, we were looking not only to boosters, but also hoping to have money left in accounts at the end of the year in order to make the athletic um, budget balance. The increases in next year's budget, for the most part, represent reflecting actual costs so they won't have to deficit spend. But it does also, it does still include mixed revenue streams from the district and from booster organizations. Okay, and I have another question um, regarding Ms. Minnick's concern. Um, if, if an entire sport costs $10,000, just throw out an arbitrary number, then would it really matter if because they can't play without a coach, but they also can't play without uniforms or balls or equipment. So would it really matter what the booster cl club supplies? I mean, if they have to supply a certain amount, does it really matter what it's going to as long as it's going to that fund? I, I don't think that it matters. Um, it matters ultimately. But when we designed the budget, we were looking to the boosters for certain things that we thought they could reasonably fund. Um, whether you take that amount of funding and distribute it over different costs associated with the sport, um, 
doesn't really matter, but I do think that in terms of trying to work with the boosters in an open and transparent way, it's important that if we ask them to fund certain parts of the program that we use the money they raise for those parts of the program. Did we ask them to fund the, um, the, 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 the coach? All the positions that are not, um, all, the, all the assistant coach positions that are not in the um, district contract with NACE and freshman coaches, we asked to be supported by boosters and have his historically asked to be supported by boosters. Okay, and do we see that changing? Because I'm, I'm, the sport I'm really considering or directed towards is the ultimate Frisbee, which just be, by the nature of it is so inclusive for all, all you know, ages or, or um, abilities, I mean. So the issue with the ultimate, um, ultimate Frisbee coaches is there is no rate in the contract for ultimate Frisbee coaches. Um, so we did budget for the teams to um, function. We budgeted for their um, tournament fees and for the equipment that they need, which is minimal, and for their transportation. The issue arises with the funding of coaches for them, not because, not from a budgeting perspective per se, per se but from a contractual perspective. Um, unlike the rest of the sports that have specified rates for their coaches and assistant coaches, there's no rate in the contract for ultimate Frisbee coaches. So we've been treating them at the nearest comparable um, position that exists within the contract, which is the intramural sports coach position, even though they're not truly intramural sports. So in this next rounds of negotiations that are coming up, is that where this would be addressed and we would be able to include the, you know, the, the salaries and, and re-examine it? Yes. So is that, is that being examined now in, in, I mean, that's what we're looking at? As, well, we're not, we're not currently in contract negotiations, but that certainly could be a proposal that either side made. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Ms. Hanna. In terms of determining um, the assistant coach stipend, um, since it's being funded by the booster club, who determines what that stipend is going to be? Is that set by the booster club? So let's say there's a booster club who can raise more funds and then pay their assistant coach more versus another. So you have two assistant coaches in different sports, but by the very nature of the resource that that sport provides, they can be, you know, have inequitable in the past, that has been an issue. In fact, it was an issue that we dealt with, I believe, on, in the uh, matter of the assistant coach for the softball team. Um, and the rate had been set in the past on the basis of whatever boosters were able to raise. Some years, um, the same individuals made different amounts of money based on what boosters were able to raise. And other years, um, Coaches in similar positions on different teams got different rates based on what boosters were able to raise. So this year the stance we took was that if there's a rate in the contract for assistant coaches, that's what the rate needs to be. The boosters have to raise that amount of money if we're going to fund the position. If they raise more, they can't use that to increase the salary for that position. What happens if they come slightly shy. Do they cancel games? Do they have half the uniform? I mean, do we just not play that year? You know, supply your own T-shirts. I mean, what happens if if we say, you know, all of you have to do it, and you know, three of them don't hit it, hit the mark? What happens to that sport? I mean, I know you said we've been deficit spending, so now we're actually putting it in the budget. Are we still going to be able to adjust at the end of the year and then re-examine again, reevaluate again? Well, the deficit spending wasn't necessarily related to coaches' salaries. Um, it was related to a whole host of things, including transportation, tournament fees, official fees, and other things. Um, we haven't been in the position this year of a booster club being able to almost fund a position um, because we've said this is what the position requires. If you want the position, this is, this is the amount that needs to be raised. Okay. Any other discussion? Hearing none, there's a motion on the table to accept these gifts. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? Okay, the gifts are accepted. Next, there's a gift uh, vote. This is the Northampton High School PTO, um, and it is to accept a gift of $2,000 for the senior class trip. This is a trip for the seniors to High Meadows. This will be a 
new tradition for Northampton High School. Um, many of the schools I've worked for in the past have taken seniors to High Meadows, and it's a day that uh, I think students really enjoy. Um, this is an, uh, an attempt by the administration, I think, to channel the energy of graduating seniors into positive directions and one that I fully support. Um, I, I think this is something that will probably take a few years to fully catch on and become a tradition, but I think it's a good direction for our kids and it's certainly a very worthy activity. Do you know what they have been doing in the past? I mean, well, when I went, they used to go over a bridge at Smith College on the little pond and <laughs> the police just closed their eyes. <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> So, yeah, <laughs> even Lisa wasn't on the board then. <laughs> no. I have, I have to say that I'm still new here, but I do know that um, last year after I had accepted the position, but before starting, I remember reading about a senior prank that included, um, you know, spreading flour over different classrooms in the high school. So I think this is an attempt to try to give seniors something that is going to be uh, more productive and less destructive for them to do. Move to accept the gift from the NHS PTO for $2,000 for the senior class trip. Second. Any other questions or discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the gift is uh, gratefully accepted from the high school PTO. Next, we have another gift, uh, the Browning School, and this is a gift of classroom technology, and I believe uh, Angelo Rota is here to speak about that. I don't think you, have, you don't have you don't have to actually have it up, oh, uh, Angelo. Okay. It's just more for the recording. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of our elementary school technology integration specialists, Drea Marks, uh, she's at Ryan Road and at the Leeds School, and she's constantly monitoring uh, listservs out of New York City in that area because she used to teach in New York City, particularly Manhattan in one of the private schools. So uh, a while ago she came across an offering from the Browning School, which is in Manhattan, Upper East Side, and they have a number of smart boards, short throw projectors, Unify smart boards, which is the board plus the projector uh, attached to it. Uh, a number of these are available, and she contacted the school. Uh, they're very willing to donate this material to us. Uh, we would love to have it. And so we're planning on, with your approval, to go on June 5th to rent a U-Haul truck and uh, go down and pick it all up and bring it back. Any, um, any uh, questions uh, from school committee members about that? don't want it. You don't want it? Okay. So I, I just have a question. Um, so how did we actually connect and decide that they were going to give it to us in Northampton? I mean, well, when they we place it on the list serve, it's, it's out there, it's available, and it's first come, first served. Wow. And so she contacted them, and they said, sure, this is great, but you must come June 5th, because if you don't, there will be other people who want it. Uh, and so that's why we want to act quickly and uh, get back to them and make sure that we'll be there June 5th so that we can get that material. That's fantastic, and that's fantastic that she was so proactive and, and was able to get that for us. It's just yeah. exciting. Any, Are we receiving this gift because they're upgrading at their school, or is it yes. becoming antiquated? <laughs> I, I wouldn't think for us. No, they're don't have to do things. These are schools that are very... Um, I don't know how you would describe them, but they're very well off. Well resourced. Say, yeah. And uh, have a lot of resources. They're moving to new equipment. Uh, this is fine equipment, nothing wrong with it. It's just that they're moving to a new level and they want to move it out. And I guess, from what I understand, June 6th, uh, they're doing new construction. And so they need to have everything out of there to make way for these uh, workers coming in and putting in new things and, and moving on. So. You've looked at uh, the places within the district that you're going to be putting the equipment and yes. building and the infrastructure supports it well? Yes. Great. Yes. 
Would you like to make a motion, Mr. I would Vice like, Chair? I would like to make a motion to accept this gift. Second it. Okay. Any other uh, questions or? Okay, all those in favor of our accepting uh, this gift from the Browning School, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Gas up the U-Haul. Yeah. <laughs> You're on yeah, your way. <laughs> Volunteer. Yeah. Okay. The next item on the agenda is a vote, and this concerns a new job description. Uh, this is a job description for a curriculum teacher leader. Uh, and I believe uh, uh, Dr. Cheevers is here to, uh, to tell us about it tonight. Thank you, good evening. Um, in the same way that we are upgrading our technology, we are also upgrading our curriculum. And this is the job description for the curriculum teacher leaders, of which we have at this point 21. We have 21 curriculum teacher leaders that have now have been trained They've been through understanding by design training. They know how to create and construct a unit according to the state standards. And the essential functions are to actively participate in uh, summer or after school curriculum meetings, to work independent hours to complete the job, facilitate grade level or department teacher curriculum reviews in their buildings, and that's a very important part of being a curriculum teacher leader, you're responsible for organizing and uh, creating curriculum across your grade level, creating meetings. Develop content understandings, essential questions, uh, KUDs, what it is we want students to know, understand, and be able to do. Assessments, differentiated instructional elements, and learning plans to work collaboratively with all of the curriculum team members to effectively write differentiated instructional plans. So this means working with special education teachers as well. To work collaboratively with all curriculum team members to effectively align curriculum horizontally and vertically. That means K through 12 and also within the grade level. Um, and to apply pedagogical content in at least one content area and or special education. Um, and the qualifications, basic knowledge of the district-wide curriculum writing template, understanding by design, interest in becoming a teacher leader for their grade level or department, basic knowledge of our ATLAS program, which is a district-wide curriculum software, and we've been providing our curriculum teacher leaders with professional development in that. In fact, we have actually even honed, we have a professional development uh, member of our curriculum committee who is actually now providing that professional development. Solid understanding of grade level content area and expectations, a history of collaboration, interest in further leadership trainings, effective communication and ability to work collaboratively in a team environment. And I'm asking the school committee to please um, approve the job description. I'd be delighted to answer any questions you might. Move to approve. There's been a motion to approve. Is there a second for discussion? Second. Okay. Any questions about this new uh, job description? Mr. Moore? Yeah. So the assumption is that uh, curriculum teacher leaders will be already an employee of the district? Absolutely. Um, but you know, it's not in the job description as a requirement, and in other words, every piece of it could be something that a person could just do independently of being well, an employee? If you look at the educational and experience under preferred competencies, it states that each teacher must have professional teacher status in the Northampton Public Schools, so, so that's that actually stated. Higher? Absolutely, yes. I didn't know. I was just saying if you could have professional teacher status. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Yes, professional teacher status. That means they've been in the district for at least three years. Dr. Provost also wanted to add something. I would also just add under compensation, uh, it references the Unit A right. contract. Right, things that made me think. <laughs> yes. It was clearly the expectation, but I didn't know if yeah. it was going to be a requirement. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It is. Any other questions about <coughs> this uh, description? Okay. Oh. Oh, okay. I guess I, how, uh, you said that you have 21? Yes, how, we do. What, what would be a full complement? I mean, is that? 
It seems like more than one per grade level. It it's, is. We would like uh, the ideal would be to have one curriculum leader uh, per building per grade level, but I don't think we'll ever be able to fund that or do that. But to have at least one person per building and let's say every other grade level and in every subject at the middle school and the high school and in grade levels, it, it comes to about 30 CTLs. That would, be, that would be as close to the ideal that we could probably do. And uh, forgive me, I think that curriculum, uh, this is clearly something, and it, it, we're gonna talk about root cause stuff a little yes. later, and, and this is clearly a place where we need to be spending some effort and some money, but it seems like when you get CTLs, now you're gonna do more curriculum writing, both of which have a stipend. Where, where's the funding coming from for this? The funding comes from our Title II. And we also have a teacher leadership grant this year that paid for some of the professional development for our teacher leaders. So that was very helpful. Any other questions about this uh, job description? Okay, hearing none. Uh, again, there's a motion made and seconded to approve it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, it is approved. Thank you, Dr. Thank Chambers. you. Um, the next item on the agenda is another job description. This is a required vote uh, to approve the food service director uh, job description. I'll turn it over to Dr. Provost. Thank you. The food service director job description in your packet is a description that was created to support the job search that we currently have underway for a replacement for Mr. Morrow. This job description um, comes to you tonight because a lot has changed in the world of food services from the last time we went out to search on this position. Um, the prior job description was about a page and a half. Um, this one, as you can see, is more extensive and it reflects changes in the field and changes in the expectations for the person who um, will be uh, taking this position. So the job description was developed collaboratively by Mr. Morrow and Ms. Walzak, um, looking at what are the actual functions that she does in reality, whether or not they're part of the current job description, what the current requirements are in the law, and what um, other comparable food service director postings and job descriptions look like. Um, so this will, this has been distributed as a draft job description with the posting that went out and we'd um, ask for your approval of this to finalize it for the candidates that we'll be talking to shortly. Move to approve the food service director job description and position. Is there a second on that? Second. Motion? Okay. Been a motion made and seconded. Ms. Minnick. Troublemaker tonight, aren't I? No. Um, I'm just curious. For no reason at all except just curiosity, do are these job descriptions reviewed by legal counsel? They're not reviewed by legal counsel, but they are reviewed by HR. Any other questions? Not a question. Ms. Fallon. The shocking turn of events. Um, there's just one typo I'd, I would maybe fix. The, should I? Point it out now, or sure. sure. Okay, the injury to co-works. It should probably be co-workers. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, any other questions about this or, or comments? I do one question. Sure, Miss Hennessy. Is this the person, the position rather, to contact parents when um, those of us who occasionally don't pay attention to our children's eating? Um, is this the person who contacts them? You mean it, for people who have balances due? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yes, those. I thought she was talking about yeah, uh, at, Our process is that the food service director is the first one um, who intervenes. Mm -hmm. After that, um, if, the, if the debt remains unpaid, the principal and the business manager in will here? become involved. I, didn't really... I don't think that is. Okay, there. is that just assumed part of it? or? It's probably more policy okay. than it is yeah. job description. Great. Yeah. Great. And 
I've gotten that call too, Ms. Hennessy, so don't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> don't feel bad. Does it um, say any duties as may be assigned? <laughs> so, um, any other questions? Okay, one more. No problem. Um, um, under essential functions, plans, directs, and budgets for food services for the all Northampton public schools. Okay, for thank you. All of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll fix that. Just for the yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions? Hearing none. All those in favor of approving the description, say aye. 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 Opposed. Any ab abstentions? Okay, so that is um, agreed to, and uh, and that process goes forward. The next item on the agenda is a report, and this is recommendations from the PE Physical Education Ad Hoc Committee, and uh, Principal Lombardi from the high school is here uh, this evening to present that. Good evening. Um, as you know, that this fall we were charged with um, putting together an ad hoc committee to discuss um, and plan the implementation of the state requirement of adding physical education to the high school. Uh, it's a four-year requirement. Um, so we started an ad hoc. The ad hoc was members including myself, Superintendent Provost, school committee members Laura Fallon, Blue Duvall, um, Karen Javers Vance, our Director of Health Services, um, and teachers from the high school, um, Sue Biggs, Jim Bridgman, Salem Derby, Lisa Leary, Bob Melnick, Maureen Moore, Melanie Similovitz, and Ben Tagliari. Um, our task, our group then broke down into three other groups, um, one being um, curriculum, policy, and schedule. Um, and we, had, we met about four times as a subcommittee, and then there were numerous meetings um, for each group as well, charged with their specific tasks. What I'm presenting to you tonight is we pretty much have a two-stage um, plan. Um, the first stage will be f um, for implementation for the class of 2020. Um, that will be incoming freshman 2016. And the initial plan will be that they continue for the first year of PE wellness to receive current wellness programming as is. That currently is a one semester course for one full credit um, covering a variety of health um, um, curriculum um, and topics. Sophomore year, they will then be taking um, 10 week PE health related um, classes or programming. Um, the counterbalance of that, we will also then have elective-based electives. So a student would take first semester a 10-week, um, maybe a, a phys ed class. And then the other 10 weeks would be of the semester, maybe a, a foundations in art or mu music class. Um, our lens for looking at this was twofold. One, to try to be cost effective. Um, if you remember um, Dr. Provost's um, presentation um, early in the year, you know, three years from now the outcomes are pretty, might be pretty tight and the concern was prevent, um, presenting a program that included adding staff right now where we, that might not be the possibility years down the road. Um, the other one was to work within our schedule as is. We have a four by four block. If you change a schedule, potentially, that could mean additional staff as well. So we try to stay within the block schedule, um, be cost effective with the staffing. My current staffing right now for my wellness department um, can cover a whole one class worth, a freshman class of wellness, as well as we think cover at least half of a sophomore class. So we think with this 10 week model, cost effective wise, we can meet that. Um, the other lens that we, try, we were trying to consider was maintaining our rich um, um, elective program that we have. The concern was that if we pushed all students into PE, in a way they, they would be coming from somewhere and that potentially would come from our elective based programming and then that would cause some serious decision making down, down the road. That's stage one. Stage two, which we'll be reconvening next fall, 2015, will be to discuss how we can continue this for our juniors and our um, sophomores. When the class comes in at 20, for 2020, again, freshman year 2016, 2017, they'll have the wellness component. 27, 2018, they'll have the 10 week model and the freshmen that come in 2017 will fall into that component. Uh, so next year we're gonna get together and begin formulate what will the, um, the 2018, 2019 school look like for them. Um, on the table right now are, is looking at maybe 
um, a full day mountain day um, where kids would go hiking or having a, a series of um, presentations that students could go for that were maybe based on health related topics um, or for example when we had Chris Heron speak early in the year create a series of events they could go to to count for um, credit for that requirement. Um, the, the state is pretty um, lack of clarity what can be the curriculum. So we're trying to have a very health-based curriculum that gives students you know, relevant information where they are developmentally entering a high school that they can carry on with them. We're trying to add activities um, that students can carry on with them outside of high school that they lead, lead to a healthy um, lifestyle. And for junior and senior year, now we're trying to figure out what would those components be, um, what would the curriculum be, and how much how many times per year, for example, would it be four seminars, um, and how would we create stipends to pay for those to be developed? Um, that is it currently. Oh, in addition to this, we also came up with um, bringing back, um, starting next year, um, every other day um, classes for students that are in special education that through a team process it was required uh, for, uh, to serve them best, that they had an opportunity to take strategy every other day and we're going to bring, bring back some electives that they'll be able to counterbalance that um, for them as well. Uh, Ms. McEachef. Um, I just had a question, and I'm not sure if this was answered earlier, but I remember, or it was, remember that it was raised, and that is whether or not students would be able to get credit for activities <coughs> that they do outside of school yeah. that may not be school-sponsored activities. As of right now, the, um, the committee felt that um, we were not going in that direction. I do need to say that right now. I think, again, considering that we're looking at something that is um, three years out from now, um, who knows what the economic landscape will be. Um, we do feel that for the freshman and sophomore um, plan that I've laid out to you, not at all. Uh, when we begin planning next year, that is not what we're looking at. We're looking at. Can I ask why? Uh, I think we felt the, the equity, there was, there was an equity issue um, beyond our athletes. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of students that come from a variety of backgrounds. Not all students might have access to events or activities outside of school. Um, and, and by doing that, um, the concern was that if there was a person that would receive credit for um, something after school, the students that didn't have access to that, therefore, would have to have that met in school. And the equity issue was that those students, therefore, wouldn't have as much opportunities to avail themselves of academic opportunities in the school day, where students, because of circumstances or situations, um, they had the luxury, maybe, of playing a sport or an activity that we counted. Those students would then be um, more available to take a wider um, berth of the classes in the school. It was. It was. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's, there's a lot of discussion about places it. Places like you know creativity, like creatively constructing, like walking program. Or I mean, I know some of that stuff can't be supervised, and there's a lot yeah. that goes into the decision. But it seems like, it seems like creatively, you know, there are things that we could places that we could go with that. Just as a suggestion. I think there was a that, lot that could maybe level off the economic. I think there was a lot of. I, a lot of willingness to create, to create a lot of ideas and go yeah. very wide in this. Um, I think what we kept on coming back is that there, sometimes it's not the opportunities of, of, a, of a class being offered, it might be a life circumstance opportunity. Some students might not, we could have a whole battery of classes or, or walking groups or whatever, we could have a huge battery. Some students might be in circumstances that, you know, it's great, I would love to take that, however, my circumstance can't avail me of that. I need to be home, I have transportation issues, I need to work to help my family out, I need to get home for babysitting, okay. et cetera. Those were the things, that, that was the voice that people were presenting at this committee that we needed to be cognizant of as we're going there. Um, and again, so at this moment, that is not something that we're moving forward in that direction. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Hennessy? I totally get that. And part of me was thinking, however, that could we flip it around, though, and say that if we were to give credit to those students who were taking after-school sports or whatever, dance, horseback riding, that is about equity, could we then offer more enriching classes and prioritize those students who, aren't, who don't have that opportunity? So for example, could we offer a RAD class for girls or a fencing class that yeah. might be something that many people can't afford, 
but those kids who can't stay after because of babysitting or whatever, they have to do work, mm -hmm. they don't have the money, um, could then be prioritized to take those classes because we have fewer kids taking them because of athletics. Does that make sense? If I, if I hear you right, are you, are you saying that if we had, if we went with the model of allowing credit to yeah. be earned, would we then have the opportunity to create more dynamic classes yeah. that in exchange for them not having the opportunity to do athletics, for example, after school, yeah. we could offer them something enriching and dynamic during the school day. And they would be prioritized to get those courses. Yes. Right. That, that, yeah, that was definitely part of the, okay. to this, the discussion. I can say this, there's a, a lot of excitement among, um, especially um, Salem Derby and the PE department, about being able to create these 10-week models. Um, and when we're looking, you know, pretty much right now, I mean, what we offer is wellness and phys ed. Yeah. And phys ed, if we all remember going back to our days, is it's, you don't really stray much off from it. It's, you know, team sports, mm -hmm. you know, and that's not for everybody. So there's a lot of um, excitement to be offering some different, from yoga to Tai Chi. I mean, I think we have a, an ability to bring some very exciting 10-week components to our students that will hopefully meet the needs of our students that want traditional team sports to Weightlifting, but also to something more dynamic um, from you know a rad program, um, th things like that. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Ball. Um, I think that the ten-week program is wonderful. I think that it's a wonderful opportunity for kids, um, students to try things out, and also I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to look at the scheduling when we're looking at the long block, short block, and be able to sort of ease our way in and see how it's working, just as you're doing with a special ed. The idea of equity, um, I'm glad that we're doing it all within the school hours, just because we don't offer transportation primarily after school, so that right there cuts out all equity. Um, I just want to say I think you've done a wonderful job with this, and I like the direction that it's going, and I, and I like the fact and really respect the fact that you're keeping equity right up there in the, in the forefront so that all students have that same opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. So any other um, comments or questions about, the, uh, about this report from the ad hoc committee? Dr. Provost. I just wanted to um, commend Mr. Lombardi on getting us to this point. Um, if you saw in yesterday's Gazette, the 25 year ago section, <laughs> So 25 years ago today, there's a new state law. Students at the high school need to take PE. Northampton hasn't really figured out what to do with it yet. So <laughs> I feel like at long last, we have a plan. A year 30, we'll be OK. <laughs> <laughs> 25 years. It's true. Um, OK, uh, thank you. Um, I don't believe there's, uh, there's a, I don't believe we have a vote scheduled for this. This was just a report. So uh, thank you, Principal uh, Lombardi, and to the committee. Nice night. Thank you. Okay, um, the next item on the agenda is a proposed teacher sabbatical. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I've skipped over. Um, uh, actually, the next item on the agenda is a presentation from the superintendent, and this is the uh, root cause analysis uh, presentation, um, which is a follow on to Dr. Provost's entry findings. So I will um, turn the floor over to Dr. Provost. Thank you. As they say, and now we're getting to the root of the matter. Um, tonight I present the results of our root cause analysis, which I hope will be the beginning of an inclusive conversation on things we really ought to change if we'd like the district to reach its full potential. Um, unlike the entry findings, the root cause analysis is not an attempt to lay out the strengths and weaknesses of the district in an even-handed and objective way. It attempts to take a look at some of the weaknesses we've identified and follow the chain of causation back to the point where we uncover some of the deep structural causes for the problems we see. It's a little denser um, in terms of its style because I, I think we're dealing with issues that um, are much more nuanced and require a, a more um, detailed explication. And it's a little harder to take on emotionally because it's just, okay, here's a problem, here's another problem, here's another problem. Um, but I think it offers the opportunity to begin a search for solutions that are capable of affecting change of a profound <coughs> sort, a, a really profound sort. Um, you know, one of the problems that we noticed in the entry findings is lack of explicit curriculum. And writing a curriculum is a great solution for that. 
But if we don't ask ourselves the question, well, how did we ever get to the point of not having a curriculum, then the same thing that caused that problem will cause another problem to arise. Um, so we looked at six of the barriers to success that we identified in the entry findings and tried to follow them down to their root causes. And we've identified six root causes for, I think, the most vexing problems for the district. And these are organized into two groups. Environmental are causes that are, originate primarily in the context of the district. And then there are organizational problems that are things that originate within the district itself. Um, and we have three of each type. And I'll talk a little bit about each of them. The first environmental cause is a growing opportunity gap. Um, at one point, I spoke of an administrator who felt that his school was becoming bifurcated. Well, if you look at the distribution of family income within our schools, um, it's not only bifurcated, but it's bimodal. Um, and this document that you have in front of you has been circulating through our office for a few weeks. Um, so people in, who work closely with me were aware of it. And I have to tell you, one day a registrar came down and said, you have to hear my morning. This is exactly what you're writing about in the first problem with opportunity gap. She said that she'd enrolled three families in the morning these were three families in the same grade, in the same school. Uh, the first student she enrolled um, was with living in a family that had obtained subsidized housing. The second family um, had just bought a home valued at over three quarters of a million dollars. And the third family she enrolled was a family who had just obtained a housing subsidy. Um, and this goes on day after day. And it's not that the schools or the district have any, any difficulty um, educating effectively students who um, are able to bring resources um, such that they're able to, their parents are able to purchase homes of three quarters of a million dollars. And it's not that we have any problems with educating students who need, whose family need help with housing. Um, we love them all and we can educate them all. But it becomes an issue when between subsidized housing and almost a million dollars, there aren't a lot of houses in the middle. And there aren't a lot of families in the middle. And so that's what we see um, increasingly in our district. And that's um, the first root cause we pointed out. And it's the first thing that I think we need to work on in terms of um, finding a very efficacious solution to some of the um, problems that we face as a district. The second uh, root cause again, primarily environmental, is the support expectation mismatch. Um, if we were sitting at, in this room or the room that preceded it, with our counterparts 100 years ago, school would be 180 days. School would have a principal and some teachers, and then the, the school board and the superintendent. Um, now we still have 180 days. We still have a principal and some teachers, but we have an incredibly different host of mandates. Um, we have educator evaluation. We have MCAS. We have adequate yearly progress. We have special education, section 504, bilingual education. All of um, these new pieces that were added to the job without adding any time or without adding any support. In fact, in some ways, we've reduced the support that's available to teachers as we've increased expectations and increased um, the complexity of the job. Um, so that doesn't necessarily set up staff to be productive and successful. Um, typically, you think of when you raise expectation levels, you want to raise support. Um, that gets people into a very productive zone. But if you raise expectation while leaving support the same or decreasing support, it can create burnout, it can create anxiety. Um, it's something that I see quite frequently. And it, it's one of the pieces of uh, this job that I have to f sort of contend with. It's a headwind. Um, there are people throughout the district and throughout schools in the, across the land who are on the verge of 
burning out, on the verge of shutting down. Um, I received an email from a teacher this morning who said, you know, between educator evaluation, DDMs, and all the new stuff I have to do just in the, the last two years, I feel like I have to stop doing all the extra stuff for kids, you know? And that's, that's not a, a, a teacher who doesn't care about kids, it's not a teacher who isn't committed, um, but it, it's a sign that the, there's a fundamental um, breakdown in the morale of our teaching core and our administrative core based on the fact that it's always more and faster and by the way, we're probably going to be critical of you if you don't do it right. Um, so the um, third root cause is conflicting accountabilities. Um, there are all different systems that are competing for the attention of administrators and teachers and trying to force behavior to go in different directions. Um, we talk a lot about school choice and we talk a lot about being in an area where there are a lot of choices for kids. And um, that creates a kind of accountability known as market accountability. Um, we also have two level three schools. We are still under the um, aegis of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and all of that brings. And that provides bureaucratic accountability and often the two collide. Um, the things that people may want to do in order to make their schools seem more attractive to others are things that the, uh, the um, bureaucratic requirements that the schools have to follow um, often say, no, you can't do that. Um, you know, I think the high school PE example in the 25 year stall was sort of a, a, a perfect example of that because the first meeting of the PE ad hoc group, um, actually this was prior to the first meeting of the PE ad hoc group, I said, well, you know, it's the law, it's been the law for a quarter of a century, all students need to take PE every year, why isn't it happening here? And the, the response that I got from a lot of people was, because everybody wants to go here, what do we care what the law is? You know, why, why would we implement something that might make the school less attractive when this is, this is a highly attractive um, educational venue for a lot of families? Um, so those are the environmental causes. Um, then we have the organizational causes. The first is fragmentation. Um, this is something that school districts are very... Um, very susceptible to um, just because of the way they're set up. Schools need to be able to run semi-autonomously because they face hundreds of very complex problems on a daily basis and need to resolve them without being able to check in and get support and um, have oversight of everything they do. However, um, the ability to be independent decision-making entities sometimes causes schools to spin off in um, their own directions and to lose contact with the mothership, if you will. <laughs> uh, so every district, I think, struggles with fragmentation, but I think that um, fragmentation in Northampton is particularly um, strong. I think it was probably exacerbated by frequent changes of leadership, which is the thing that can kind of hold it together and give um, schools a, a common sense of focus. Um, and so it, um, can get to, and I'm not going to say it's to this point yet, but there are very strong camps around a number of things that are set up in different schools. And um, bringing that all back together into a cohesive vision of K-12 education for the district um, will be necessary for this, this district to function the way that it should. Um, the next organizational cause is reactive strategies. Um, this is something that we spend a lot of time wordsmithing about um, because one of the original 
earlier drafts of this said that um, if you look at the organizational behavior of Northampton schools, you see a preference for um, reactive strategies. And a lot of people said, well, we sh it's not really that we had a preference. <laughs> Maybe we had a predilection, or maybe that's what we did, but we didn't want to be making the decisions we were. We, we kind of forced in that direction. Um, so um, as, I, as I point out in the work, a reactive strategy is very, is, very, is a very good strategy if the prior status quo was excellent and it's something you can return to, and the new condition is worse. Um, however, when you're trying to implement reactive strategies in the context of a rapidly changing um, environment, it's not a good strategy because you're trying to go back to a condition that you can never go to again because the environment has changed too much. Um, so in order to move forward, I think we have to get out of this pattern of um, looking backwards to reestablish the old order to thinking about, okay, we're in a new world now. And how, what are the opportunities of the new world? And how do we strategize to prepare for that? And then the final organizational cause is political versus data-informed decision-making. Um, I think on one level, there's a distrust of data universally in the district, data of any kind, um, whether it's data that comes from um, standardized testing, or whether it's data that comes from a teacher's own classroom, or whether it's data about attendance. Um, I was I was observing um, a conversation between educators, and there was a teacher who was doing an intervention, and it was appearing to be a very effective intervention. And the principal said, "You know, we really should get some data about what you're doing and share." And the reaction was shut down, They're like you know, no. That is bad. Um, so that that's one half of the uh, the equation. The other half is that a lot of a lot of um, the decisions within the district have sort of been promulgated not on the basis of what data would suggest would be best for kids, but on the basis of what side, camp, whatever, is able to marshal the most political support for its cause at the time. Um, so, you know, an example of, of that was a conversation I was having not long ago with some teachers about um, one of the curriculum <laughs> issues, one of the many curriculum issues in the district, and the response to something I had said was, well, you know, I think if this is the decision the district makes, we're not even going to bother with the school committee. We'll go right to city council. And I'm like, okay, so first of all, that's not appropriate. Second of all, it's not data informed. And third of all, it, it, it really is symptomatic of the idea that we, decisions aren't made sort of on the basis of what we know about what's best or what we can know about what's best as much as they're made on who can, um, who can bring the, 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 the best political organization to the table. Um, so those six things are very deeply embedded habits, if you will, within the district that uh, I think we have to work on addressing in the next district improvement plan. And so now that I've sort of taken you to the bottom, um, the, the hope is that if we have a district improvement plan that focuses on strategies that aren't tinkering around the edges, strategies that aren't, let's try this program or let's try that program or let's do more technology, but things like, okay, so let's develop some strategies to address this growing opportunity gap because it looks like this is the population we're going to have to educate. Some strategies around, okay, instead of functioning as six schools, why don't we function as a single district? Um, strategies that say, before we do anything, let's see what the data says. Um, those are the things that I think would really transform the way the district operates and really bring us to a, a much higher level of functioning. And so um, we're shortly to begin the district improvement planning process. Um, I have some dates that I'll be announcing when I do my superintendent's report. And my hope is that um, our next district improvement plan is targeted laser-like on strategies that are related to ameliorating or eliminating these six root causes.
Ms. Minnick. Wow, I sort of feel like I just stood in front of the mirror in my underwear. <laughs> the situation. You have, um, you really have, like, shown a bright light on the district, a harsh light, if you will, even. Um, and it was, it is, it was depressing. It is a little hard to read all the problems one after another. So, number one, I appreciate your presentation just now, including the humor that it did, so that it's not totally unpalatable. Second, um, I want to say how informative and educational this is for the school committee to hear this, and I'm sure for a lot of other people in the district to hear these sorts of things. It, it shows um, the kind of depth that you've gone into to, and, and I'm, I'm, I continue, I, I've said this before and I don't mean to embarrass you in public, but I continue to be blown away by the level of commitment and the, the sort of thoughtfulness that you bring to your position. It's uh, very refreshing. The third thing I would like to say is thank you because I realize that while this is your job, it, you've got a lot of other stuff that you do every hour of your work day that is your job and by rights this has to be done sometime outside of that time so I appreciate very much the time and effort that you've put into this and I, I want to thank the people with whom you worked I assume the administrative leadership team deserves some credit for looking at this I have a couple of questions one of which is if, those, if the administrative leadership team was involved in creating this, um, that's, that's sort of like, um, again, a, a self-examination. Were they surprised to find that they were fragmented, that they weren't working as cohesively as they might have thought? Or maybe they work together well, it's their buildings that don't seem to mesh? Is that more? So the primary strategy we used in order to get at the roots is this technique called the five whys, where you put up a problem and then you just keep asking why and then you ask why to the answer that, that is purported for that. So these conclusions came out of those discussions. It wasn't me saying, oh no, you're fragmented. It was people answering the question saying, you know what, we're, we're, we're all doing our own thing. And that's, that's one of the problems. So um, they were, I would say not surprised by the findings. I think they were um, engaged in a way by the process that allowed them to reveal things that they already knew about themselves in a way that felt safe enough that they could say it. Do you want to give us a sneak preview on how you may be looking to come up with a district improvement plan that addresses these things? Do you are are you going to use the five the five whys on us or <laughs> I bet you. Or, or, do you have another so, another? Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, we have dates. I'm sorry. You can save it for your sure. report if you want. We have dates um, identified. The uh, We'll be meeting in the JFK Library May 21st, 28th, June 4th, 15th, and 22nd. And we're looking to have six different groups um, working on each of the root causes. Each group will have an administrator, uh, teacher, parent, community member, and I'm also looking for two school committee members to serve, so I'll um, just throw that out there. And so. Um, there is a process that, that I'll be asking them to use, and one person will be sort of in charge of facilitating each group. The um, first part is to come up with a theory of action which says, okay, so if this is where we are now, what conditions would we need to change in order to get to the opposite state or to get to a state that was closer to what we want it to be? And then um, after sort of the theory of action is developed to describe individual tactics that can be employed in a sequenced way over the next three to five years to um, successfully move from the current state to where they want to be. And then we'll bring all the groups together at the end to sequence them because you can't work on all six root causes at once. Um, in fact, my philosophy is you can only do three things well in a year, especially when you have the support 
mis expectation mismatch already going. And one of the things is something you can't plan for that will just force its way onto your agenda. So you should really plan for two things and leave a placeholder thing for the third. Um, so we'll sort of strategize what is the best sequence to implement the initiatives that the different working groups come up with and then bring that back to the committee hopefully in July, maybe in August, um, for the committee to approve. And then the school improvement plans will be developed from there um, and break down the tactics at even greater level of detail for how do we implement these things within our individual buildings. I'm excited. <laughs> Other uh, comments, Mr. Ball? I have to reiterate what Lisa said as far as I'm really excited for the direction that we're going and the amount of, of thought and work that you've put into this um, and clarity. It's, it's just awesome as far as it goes. Um, phys Ed, we did do Phys Ed. We, years ago that was something they cut okay. and then they brought it back. <laughs> Actually we cut it out of, the, out of the elementary school and tried to keep it all the way and there were a lot of problems where the state was not happy with us. So it, it's been a roller coaster. But um, I just wanted to thank you very, very much because this, there's a plan. I mean, there's a plan. We can see it. I've been on this for four years. I've not seen a plan. And this is exciting. Uh, yeah. Ms. Nyker, I'd just like to add one quick thing to that, Inez. I appreciate your honesty. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's really important. It's important for us all to hear it. It's, it's important for us all to know it's OK to be honest. And without that, we can't move forward. So I appreciate that. Other comments? Other uh, discussion points? Okay, well, uh, oh, I, th I thought you raised your hand, sorry. So, okay, well, you'll be um, reminding folks of those dates and when this uh, process moves forward. Okay, um, now the next item on the agenda is a, uh, a vote on the question of whether or not to approve a teacher sabbatical. And I'll turn this over to uh, Dr. Provost. Can I ask one quick question? Is this, sorry about that, is, the, is this gonna be online? Yes. It is online. Okay. It will be online tomorrow. Tomorrow. Awesome. Good. Thank you. Okay. Um, sabbatical. So in your package you have a request from Rob Adams from Jackson Street School to take a sabbatical. Um, you'll notice that the date on this is March 16th, which is beyond the deadline for a sabbatical. Um, however, I would encourage uh, the committee to consider not rejecting it out of hand solely on the basis of its untimeliness. Um, I did tell Mr. Adams that the budget had been developed without um, taking into account a request for a sabbatical and if he was interested in taking it as an unpaid sabbatical would also, which would also mean it's an unbenefited sabbatical that I uh, would support affording him the other benefits that the sabbatical provides which is to be able to maintain seniority and to be able um, to have an um, I'm not sure where this individual is on the steps um, but if you look at if you look at the substance of the proposed sabbatical it's very worthy um, he will be at the Charles Darwin research station um, not only enhancing his understanding of science but also working on some computer programming um, so I think it certainly is within the spirit of what sabbaticals are meant to be um, but, uh, but unfortunately, we're just not in a position where we can pay it. And he is, um, he is interested in taking it as an unpaid and unbenefit sabbatical if the committee approves. When was the deadline for the um, request? When I, should believe, it be? I believe it's sometime in January. Okay. That's per the NACE contract? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, I'd like. Go. I just, I just sure. Is there a precedent on this? Uh, there have been uh, sabbaticals granted in the past, uh, although it was came through the timeline that's you know outlined in the contract. The idea being that if if the committee or the district is, knows about it by January, it could be incorporated mm -hmm. into a budget in terms of you know substitute and you know all the other factors that it would create. Right. So. Is this the first one that's come up past the deadline? 
as certainly my administration. I, uh, <laughs> in all these months. <laughs> uh, yeah, during my time as well, I, I believe I've only experienced one sabbatical request. Let's let's turn it over to Ms. Minnick. I have no concept. I'm sorry, I don't remember. Okay. That one that we did approve last year. Yeah. Was the first one in a long time. The first yeah, one that we requested. Yeah. Okay. Is there any downside to approving this besides setting the precedence for allowing it so late? I honestly don't see it. I mean, the um, the de potential downside would be if it was to be offered as a paid sabbatical because right. we don't have it in the budget. Right. But I think if he's willing to take it unpaid, then there's really no downside for the district. Ms. Hennis. A benefit of this is this is an incredibly well-regarded, um, valuable teacher at Jackson Street who would lose seniority and he would lose his position essentially. Is that true? If, What's that? if, if we, we did not to grant it, it, he would... The, the only other option would be for him to resign. Right. So, or I mean, to not go. That's a big downside right. for the district, in my opinion. I'd like to make a motion to approve the sabbatical without pay, but with maintaining his place and all the other benefits that he's allowed to maintain. Second. Okay. Ms. Minnick. Does the association have any problem over making that kind of decision? Does that put them in an awkward position? I don't know. Hmm. Well. Sorry I asked. No, it's fine. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. We certainly, this is not the first time we we are encounter, we encounter you know, requests that are made where a deadline hasn't been met and we, we do have the discretion. Right. Um, so, uh, okay. Any other questions or discussions about this? Mm -hmm. So there's been a motion made and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is adopted. And, uh, and uh, Mr. Adams will be heading off to the Galapagos. <laughs> so uh, that should be exciting um, for him and his family. So the, um, the next item on our agenda is a uh, report from Ms. Minnick and the Rules and Policy Subcommittee, as well as uh, at least four votes on some of the policies that have um, been been percolating through that committee. The uh, bullying and harassment revised, the policy adoption revised, the budget transfer authority revised, and the public gifts to the schools uh, revised are all up for a vote tonight. And then we have uh, first readings on school-based management, uh, the format for SIPs, the social media and electronic communication, and the graduation requirements. So I'll turn it over to Ms. Minnick. All right. The first one is policy ACAC, bullying and harassment. It was presented to you at the last meeting. The only changes in that were housekeeping involved with uh, updating definitions that finally came down from the state so that our policy was in alignment with the state um, definitions the wording that they use. So and I, my recollection is that there were no um, questions or concerns about that policy when it was presented last time. So um, if I guess I would move to that the board, that the uh, school committee approve the bullying and harassment uh, policy ACAC as presented. Second. Okay. And recommended by the uh, rules and policies of committee. Okay. Any uh, further questions or discussion regarding that motion? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that policy is adopted. Okay. I would also move, and the rules and policy subcommittee recommends approval of policy adoption policy BGB, which was presented also at our last meeting. In that particular one, there was a some changes in language and um, by request that the when the policies were sent to you the last time they were they had uh, you know they were redlined or or uh, had yellow highlight to show the language that would be included or what was being changed by request we've sent them out so that they read the way they would read if they're approved with your current with the packet for this meeting 
So I can't tell you exactly what was changed, I but we were going to get um, both. Actually, I thought the the idea was to send along it with the yellow, and then send along like in a, right afterwards the actual adoption. Somebody who's policy. more prepared than I am, I can <laughs> tell you that the um, there was a sequence. It's listed here the sequence of what was going on. There was um, the change to the policy was to eliminate um, wording that says that we could abbreviate the, we could vote to abbreviate the above sequence to meet emergency conditions or to expedite routine matters. It put that into two sentences instead so that we can, I, I'm not even sure why, just for clarification I think. But the main purpose of this uh, policy was to, in some way, streamline our policy adoption process. The, I, there is one other thing that was deleted, and that's the big difference. I'm sorry, I missed that. It was the second paragraph. It said, uh, presented as an agenda item to the committee in the following sequence at successive meetings. And I think it was unclear because it does say the first item there is that it will be distribution with the agenda. And that had been interpreted as being its own meeting, that, that it would go out with an agenda for one meeting, then it would be considered at the next meeting, and it would be voted at a third meeting. And it was making our policy adoption process take three months when ideally it should only take two months which would be distribution with the agenda and information at one meeting and then vote the next month at the following meeting. So that's the probably the biggest change to this policy. Excellent. So and to my knowledge there were no questions or concerns about this one unless somebody wants to make an amendment right now. Did you move to? Take, I think I did. Uh, I? Why don't you go ahead. Uh, I thought I moved it. She did. Okay. okay. And has there been a second? Yes. She did it, I did it. <laughs> it just was now, so oh, okay. seconded. Um, any other questions about this? Okay, all those in favor of adopting this uh, policy change, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Okay, so the um, policy on policies is adopted. Okay, the next one on the agenda, so I would like to move, and the Rules and Policy Committee recommends, approval of the revised budget transfer authority policy DBJ second second oh. okay, okay. Um, budget transfer authority I do not know what oh uh, <clears throat> part of it had to do with eliminating uh, making the superintendent solely responsible for approval of transfers and things like that. We have now allowed for, for um, principals, I believe. Am I correct? I think the other report. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the other one. Yeah, the sorry, other that's the gift one. Do with not yeah. granting authority for yeah. both transfers being done in order to create a new it, it's sort of like it took order. all of the yeah it was <laughs> all of this right. stuff right here and that. rewrote it so um, but it has to do with the authority at the end of the year for closing the budget to allow for uh, transfers that are in excess of ten thousand dollars or transfers being done to create a new um, position or program it leaves the, the ability to do that with only the superintendent and then it says, however, that it doesn't have to come, excuse me, if it's in excess of $10,000 or if it creates a new program, it has to come to the school committee. The superintendent can approve them if they don't, if they don't, if, except for those two exclusions. However, in the case of closing the budget at the end of the year, we'd like to let the superintendent and the policy states um, make those transfers without respect to the above exclusions. And the, there was a question raised at our last meeting regarding those restrictions. And I think Laura wanted to know why did we need to get rid of both of those restrictions? Because really, we shouldn't be doing a transfer that creates a new program or a position. It really is only the $10,000 limit. So I think it would be wonderful if she would create an, an amendment 
that stated that. Basically, I think you could do that by moving to amend the proposed policy um, in the last paragraph where it says without the above restrictions. If you just say without the above $10,000 limit to transfer funds to close the fiscal books. Okay, so I'm supposed to make the end of it? Well, you were the one who brought, brought it up the last time. Somebody, anybody, <laughs> anybody can make that suggestion, <laughs> except that I already just recommended the policy okay. as it was proposed. Okay, so I'm saying so. I move to amend yes. budget transfer authority policy um, to state in the last sentence that before the end of each fiscal year, the school committee shall vote and grant the superintendent or his or her designee the authority without the $10,000 yeah. restriction to transfer funds to close the fiscal year books. Second. Okay. So that is that, that, that captured the amendment? Okay. So there's been an amendment made and seconded. Um, um, any discussion on the amendment to the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So um, the, the motion that's on the floor to adopt the policy has now been amended. Um, and now we're back to the uh, main policy as amended. Any further discussion on that? Hearing, oh, Ms. I Smith. just want to note that it does say before the end of the fiscal year, we have to take a vote. So that should be a routine vote mm -hmm. every year in June mm -hmm. that we vote to do that. I don't know if we routinely do that, but it should be on our list of things okay. to do. Okay, all those in favor of this uh, policy as amended, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is adopted. Oops. Next, oh, go ahead. Next is public gifts to the schools. Um, at our last meeting, it was presented to you, and it had to do. This was the one that in, that now includes principals can accept things. Um, let's see. I want to go through this right. <laughs> It's, and I really, I, it, I think that was in there before, actually. It says that the school committee will have the authority to accept all gifts, and I think what we've proposed is that the superintendent will have the authority to accept all gifts and equipment for the schools with a total value not to exceed $1,000, and gifts with a value greater than $1,000 will be presented to the school committee. And further, it says the principals will have the authority to accept all gifts with a total value not to exceed $1,000 from their respective PTOs. So that's the change, is that all gifts oh, and also used to come to us. And now, gifts less than $1,000 can be approved by the superintendent, and gifts from PTO less than $1,000 can be approved by a principal. It also, uh, we added that the district reserved the right to dispose of any donated property that's no longer needed or considered too costly to maintain. And um, it, ta that it also talks about the ability uh, for a gift to be used for the donor's intended purpose without further appropriation. The previous policy language was somewhat confusing, and so we cleaned that up. And finally, it, um, said that a report of all the gifts accepted by the superintendent would be presented publicly to the school committee on a regular basis. And my recollection is that someone had a concern about that particular language and the amendment to that might theoretically be in that last paragraph of that policy, a report of the gifts accepted by the superintendent and or the principals mm -hmm. will be presented publicly to the school committee at the next or at the subsequent monthly meeting rather make than on a regular basis. So if somebody would like to make a motion to amend the policy. I'll make a motion to amend the policy to include that. So that was to that add the principal and, the pr and, or and or principles and then to, and yeah. to change on a regular that, basis. Yeah, we, uh, um, there hadn't been an original motion yet. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um. That's true. So I move and the um, Rules and Policy Committee recommends acceptance of the revised policy uh, KCD public gifts to the schools. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. And now if somebody wants to make that. Yeah. I would like to make the amendment to state in the last line the report of the gifts accepted by the superintendent and or the principals will be presented publicly to the school on a regular basis. No. no. At, actually, at, the next, at, the, at the next. At the next. 
Oh, okay. subsequent the subsequent meeting. Yeah, that's yes. what I wanted. Yeah, exactly. All right, at the next school meeting. At the subsequent monthly meeting. Okay. Yeah. okay. Did you get that, Laura? She's the one who made it up. Oh, she. <laughs> She's definitely got it. Okay. Um, I second. Okay. Ms. Hennessy seconds. Um, any discussion on the proposed amendment? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So the amendment is accepted. So now we're back to the main motion as amended. Any discussion on the overall policy, Mr. Moore? Yeah, I have a couple of questions about the very first paragraph. I don't know. Just if I, maybe it's clear enough to everybody, but I was curious about the part about when the gift is of educational value. So does that mean the superintendent does not have the authority to accept all gifts and equipment to the schools if it's not of educational value? So, if, I mean, you, know, you can picture a thing that wouldn't be of educational value, like a sign or, a, you know, a memorial sort of thing outside the building, you know, not really private school. And I just wondered what that, what, why we have that language in there in the first place, you know, of educational value. Because, you know, and if maybe we would be better off without it, but I don't know, maybe people had a reason for it. Did you make an amendment before we approved it? <laughs> you start over again. <laughs> well, no, I, we haven't approved the whole thing yet. Oh, well, oh, 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 oh. We'll find out okay. if we make them or if there's yeah. a really good reason okay. for having that phrase yeah. in there, in which case I'm happy to leave. Okay, I'm sorry. Dr. Provo. I think there is a good reason. Um, on any given day, I get between a dozen and 20 offers of free things for the schools, which often have very little educational value and often very long um, strings attached. So I think the essence of this is to say that the superintendent should exercise discretion and not accept things that are not going to be in the best interest of the school. Right, but that's, that would be implied. You, you have the authority to accept or reject anyway, mm -hmm. right? Right. But I just wonder, maybe it's maybe it's just the drafting thing because it sort of it's implied it sort of ties into the thousand dollars, you know. It's tied, it sort of ties oh, yeah. as a condition, you know. It's, yeah. So you know, and so in other words, and I don't know, I, am I able to accept, or is the committee able to accept gifts of over a thousand dollars that have no educational value? Is that what you're saying? Okay. Which we might do actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just don't know. So does there need a period in that sentence somewhere yeah, to break that up? To break that up? To something. Um, I just, I'm just curious about it. Just, it struck me as I think little, anything could uh, be argued to have educational value. I think we could, you know, if that's what your question was. And that's so subjective. Well, my, question, yeah, my question is sort of why, yeah, why is, it, why is it in that particular sentence, yeah. I guess? Why is it that? I, I, I sort of think that it because was designed to repeat percent. what was in the all first sentence. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's and I right. think yeah. that it was then designed to repeat that same language in different words, but you're right, it does make it unwieldy. We think that this is the MASC language, so it may have come. Make it right. And I agree that. <laughs> I agree. I'm just, I'm just no, I think it was so. designed to reiterate I just feel like it the same thing. As opposed to clarity, you know, when I read it. Why can't we just cut out that last part of when the gift is of educational value? Right, because or to or or to just use the same words again and say the superintendent will have authority to accept all educationally appropriate gifts and equipment for the schools. Exactly. Total value. Awesome. Okay, so you can be you can make that amendment, make that motion to amend. She made the first motion. It doesn't matter. Go ahead. You can you can make the. Uh... So, I move that we amend the policy to. Delete the words when the gift is of educational value and insert words earlier in that sentence that says all educationally appropriate gifts and equipment for the schools with the total value okay. not to exceed a thousand dollars. So there's been, school a, um, there's been another amendment made unseconded. I'm sorry though. Yeah. Can you explain that last one? Are you saying educational value to that principal statement? Are you adding that? No. 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 Okay. No. Thank you. It, the sentence will now read. Um, the superintendent will have the authority to set, accept all educationally appropriate gifts and equipment for the schools with a total value not to exceed $1,000 in the name of the school committee, period. Okay. Gifts with a value greater than $1,000 will present, be presented to the school committee for approval. Are you maintaining the first sentence then? Yes. Okay, okay so. I'll second that, amendment. Okay, Mr. Moore is going to second that. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so now the, um, we're back to the main motion. Um, as twice amended. Any other <laughs> amendments or? No, Mr. Moore. 
<laughs> uh, it's still in the first paragraph. This is the gift that keeps on giving. That's right. <laughs> so now we're back down to the principles who have the authority to accept all gifts. Apparently, they don't have to be educationally appropriate. I mean, I just, you know, again, I just, I hated that. But they could accept a gift from the PTO for a luncheon for their teachers. Exactly. That's and, and then why shouldn't the superintendent be able to accept those kind of gifts also? That's why I don't, I'm not happy really with this educationally appropriate thing entirely as it being like a threshold you have to clear. It seems like if it's a gift and if it's a value to the yeah. schools, okay. Mm -hmm. I, I know I just don't understand. I just, I mean, I know the MASC proposed it apparently, but I just don't understand that, that, that threshold language. Might just have to let it go, Howard. Sorry, I know. <laughs> <laughs> From one attorney to another. <laughs> Sorry. And I, and I may let it go. <laughs> I, but that's, that was that was my commentary on this. I wouldn't know I'm happy with this. I just when I read it. I Is this something you could I, mean, I agree with him. Um friction. You know, worry about periods and stuff. I do agree with with uh, Mr. Moore. He's making a, a very valid point, even though I'm on the rules and policy and we didn't see this, but it makes sense. So would it be your interpretation that if it, if it was a non-educationally appropriate gift, that any gift of that kind would just have to come to the school committee? Well, the, the, super, appropriate the, the, the principal could accept it if it was less than $1,000, all if it's gifts, from okay. if it's from the PTO, right? If it's from the PTO. But then, every, but, I mean, that's what I'm wondering. Is it, it causes you to need to have an interpretation, whereas if you just didn't say it, you, hmm. you know? Could we say just appropriate? <laughs> I mean, all yeah, appropriate. Yeah, I don't need to have an interpretation. Well, so then aren't we subjecting, even if it says appropriate, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate? Well, course, Our exactly. ideas are all yeah. It's even more simply understanding yeah. hard. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we give, the, we, if we give the superintendent the authority to accept gifts, that means he has authority to reject right. gifts. And trust his judgment, that's what we're saying. We're saying for less than a thousand or a thousand dollars or less, we're, we're, we're saying it's okay. You, even if we think it's maybe it wasn't the best thing to accept, well, okay, it was less than a thousand. It's not like you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we're saying, and 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 then to throw in this little kind of. If you don't know the following. Okay, okay, how about this? If you delete the word "all," <laughs> it doesn't really change it, but it kind of changes right, it. Does. it. Right. The word "all." But it doesn't deal with my other problem with the educationally appropriate. Yeah, but it. It. <laughs> Softens it a little bit. I mean, it broadens it. So, is there a, is there a desire to amend that to make a further amendment? We could also ask the superintendent to report back to us in a year on how this policy <laughs> is functioning, and whether, it needs, whether he's getting lots of I mean, uh, inappropriate, educationally gifts. inappropriate. Uh, yes. That's right. Right. It may not come around for another eight years. Right. Yeah. Um, this big had to go through. So. No, you know, actually, you know, what, where I would be would be saying something like, appreciates all gifts, in the very first thing, instead of educationally appropriate, all gifts consistent with this, you know, the mission. mission or vision of the school district. You know, because I think that's more like the kinds of things we want to accept. We don't want to accept stuff that undermines us or distracts us, but they don't really have to be educational. They can be, you know, supportive. They gave you wording like that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. That, but I'm not sure I want to bother with that because you guys did, I mean, the committee did spend some time and I do approve it, I mean, it makes sense. We spent time on the thousand dollars and whether principals should do it or not and stuff like that. We didn't, that first right. few lines oh, was okay. from MASC. Right. We didn't mess with that. Okay, well then I'm just gonna do that. I'll make, a, I'll make it a proposal and amendment. So um, now we have to undo North Hampton School Committee, just did. I would propose the first sentence read, the North Hampton School Committee appreciates all gifts to the district all, all, all um, gifts consistent with the district's um, mission. Do we have I'm to come up with that. the wording right this second? Wouldn't you rather think about it? I would rather think about it. Do we, is, there, is there a reason that we have to? We can table it. Somebody this is going to look around, around table eight this years of policy. And exactly <laughs> Maybe longer. Policy. I'm just, I just don't know why we have to do, he has to come up with wording yeah. like off the top of his head right this second. We can, put, we can post We wouldn't have had to next. approve that. Yeah. One of those booster club, you know, the art yeah. party um, thing for four hundred dollars tonight, but we did it as a lump batch. So right. it, yeah. I mean, it's not. But I mean, yeah. that would have been something that now would fall to the superintendent to do. So I don't want to leave this policy forever, but it wouldn't be a. I don't think it would be a big um, problem for us to table it for a, a month, and you could. Come well, it's back. going to be more than a month because we're not meeting again until July. What? What? Why? 
since no, when? No, the Rules and Policy Committee. No, 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 no we're not saying send it back saying, to the committee. He just wants oh, to. Oh, just to him to do it. He's yeah. talking about yeah. tabling yeah. it yeah. back at our next meeting, and by then he will have developed a language, the language for his amendment that he's going to make at that meeting. And that he feels Could we have to move to table yeah. it? Yeah. Someone has we're to. Gonna, we're, not, we're not going to table it. We're going to uh -huh. postpone Post consideration oh, of the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Is that so? Is that allowed? Yeah. Sure. So we're just gonna we're just gonna to put me we're just gonna postpone consideration <laughs> okay. until next month. I'd like to make a motion to postpone consideration yeah. of the public gifts to the school yeah. policy until next month, so we have the opportunity to. So we'll pick up where we left off. All yeah. the sections. So that we're sort of like time out until the next meeting. So all the Got amendments it. and everything to date are we'll pick right up where we left off. Okay. We don't have okay, to go through okay. that again, Mike. Okay. <laughs> Then I promise I'll let it go. Okay. Let it go. Um. <laughs> right. Um. We didn't vote on that. Yes. Yeah, so um, there's been a motion made and seconded. All those in favor, say aye. To, aye. to do what? To postpone until the next meeting. Sorry. Yes. Aye. He seconded it. Yeah. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So we'll move on now to the first reading on four other items. <laughs> First one of those is CFD, school based management. And um, if you read through that, you will see that the recommendation is to pretty much just kind of axe most of our existing policy in favor of writing some other language. And um, I might even. Ask the superintendent to help me on this one. The um, we already cite the law. There are some things in the law, and there was a lot of stuff in there that was not included in the law. There's a lot of stuff in there that's not our purview to determine, and so we're recommending a more streamlined policy. Maybe you want to add something to that. I, I think you did it perfectly. the The changes here are all rec recommended on the basis of not creating additional hoops to jump through that are not required for um, school councils. And the reason, the rationale for that is that every school has a very different context and um, the process of seating the council um, may be different at a 900 seat, a 900 student high school than it is at a 290 student elementary school. And so this, um, Pr proposal maintains all of the required components of the school of uh, the school council law but takes out all the flourishes that were added at a previous time of this policy's life so I already spoke with the superintendent about this but the only concern I had about this was that I think it's great that each school has its own um, is can independently decide what their process is whether they're having elections or recruiting volunteers or how they're working but I think that that process needs to be transparent and advertised by the school um, principal as to this is how we will we have this many positions open this is how those positions will be filled because I think that you run into a problem sometimes where the principal thinks that there's no one interested in filling a position so they ask someone and someone else was like hey why didn't you ask me to do it um, and so I feel like it needs to definitely be advertised that we are looking to fill these positions I don't know that it needs to be in here but I, I feel that that's a really important component the school council mm -hmm. needs to be advertised um, I thought they all were voted on. I thought, no. No, it's different for all the schools. Wow. The okay, because Ryan Road, what they do is they. Well, that's what the policy was. That's what the policy was, I think, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the policy wasn't necessarily being followed because people weren't actually running for mm -hmm. the school council at all of the schools. Mr. Moore? I have uh, another comment. It's, uh, I don't know if this policy is the right place to put it, but. Regarding the whole the question of fragmentation, you know, we're, one of the things we want to work on is is um, collaboration I th between at, in all the different ways, all of our, all of our different schools. And um, I mean, an example would be this last year where the elementary schools worked on one handbook for the elementary schools. Um, and and I don't know, <coughs> I, you know, the school councils are required to be independent and just for their school. But at the same time, I think there would be real value in them in some way 
formalizing, you know, institutionalizing communication mm -hmm. between them. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't, and maybe, so maybe this is policy would be the place to add some kind of language to, you know, to institutionalize, I don't know, some sort of, you know, semi-annual communication was between them. It but was there was in the old there and one. they took it out. Right, because, because no it's not part of the, it. And it's also not part of the law. Oh. Right. So, so this is, this is, I really think this is great to have a stripped down basic thing. And so I'm a little, that's why I'm a little hesitant about saying, I don't know if it's got to be in this policy or not, because I like it because it's cleaner. But on the other hand, I think part of the problem with the law is precisely it's, it sort of sets up these schools as being, you know, elbows out, you know. Um, and it doesn't provide any mechanisms for them to be in communication with each other, which I think is really valuable within the district. So I don't know, it's just something to think about, I guess. Okay. Um. I suggest you think about it and come back with an amendment to this next month. If you well, I don't want to do oh. something that'll, I, you know, we used right. to have a bunch of administrators in the audience, but yeah. I don't want to impose anything on the, on the principles right. that right. isn't, you know, appropriate either. I'm not, uh, that's why I'm hesitant about it, but I think it's a subject I'd like, mm -hmm. it's more like a conversation that I think that administrators should, maybe the administrators should think about if they want to put something in the policy. So I have Ms. Fallon and then Ms. Ball. Yeah, I was just going to say the only other thing that I was a little bit sad to see was that initially it was in the policy that they were to post minutes or make them available. That wasn't happening. And now the new wording is that they will um, make the minutes available to the superintendent who will then make them available to us on request. But it doesn't say anything about, well, what about a parent who wants to know what happened at that meeting? Dr. Provost? It actually says that the school council meetings will be subject to the open meeting law, which right. means that they need to maintain minutes and they need to produce them on request for anybody, so, not just school committee members. Okay, but I'm saying so they're not automatically produced. They have to go. I, I just, we no, it says ours. I wonder if it would be simple, if they're going to be producing them and they're going to give them to you, why can't they sense. post them? It would make sense. Okay. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because open meeting law just means you have them. Right. Yeah. I'm just saying it seems logical mm -hmm. to put it on the website. And then also schools could compare what's going on at the other schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's, not a, it's not a requirement of the open meeting law, but it could certainly be a best practice or a yeah. policy. That right, but I don't know that it needs to, to go in. I'm not yeah. sure what, mm -hmm. I don't know how, if, I feel like if it doesn't go in it, then we're just saying it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but on the other hand, I, we've stripped down the language to add more in seems right. counterintuitive. Same. Same problem. Well, right. if we're stripping down the language to get rid of things that we don't think are necessary, I mean, it, but we're adding something that we do value, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think we're taking out what's not required, but maybe putting in something that we might want to see. It may not be required, but it might make sense for Northampton. Right, right. but I don't know. can I get my turn? Mr. Ball. Thank you. <laughs> what I was going to say about that is I'm not really sure that it's a, it's, it's a place to actually have it in a policy as much as um, a best practice and something that we work towards culturally changing and um, within the schools, not necessarily just at the school council, but start to make it a priority and an importance for the different schools to um, get together. And I'm not sure that we should say you have to do it twice a year and actually have it in a policy, but you know, see if we can encourage more sharing and, you know, I, I just hate to just tell them they have to do it. I'd rather have them want to do it. And I think if we encouraged more of that environment of cultural sharing of, of the advantages, then they probably would want to do it. And I don't think that we would have to set it up as far as making them do it since it's not part of the law. That's just my opinion on that. Okay. I think we have two different things going, but um, Ms. Minnick. Um, I'm okay with making them post the minutes. Yeah. Um, as far as making them get together, I think that there's an, an intermediate step. You can say the school committee encourages, right. you know, school councils to meet jointly to discuss, you know, issues of significance to all of the buildings or whatever, so mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. kind of 
frothy, foamy well, language. You yeah. know, we could encourage that. We can also encourage the PTOs. I mean, we just, that's what I'm saying, we start to establish a different type of cultural Well, that's a different policy. Yeah, that's not a different policy. That's a different policy. Right, it's just and so I, I'm encour yes, and encouraging is fine. It doesn't specify that they have to do it, but it, do, it certainly invites them to do something and it leaves the door open for it. So my only question is if you're, because some of the language we took out was that they were also going to meet with the school committee once a year. So if you were encouraging them to meet with each other, are you also going to encourage them to meet with us? Why did that practice stop? Or was I just not it sure started, it, it started because there were some budget concerns and also because school councils were brand new and we thought that it would be, and, and also because they had not yet identified the district improvement plan and the school improvement plan at the very beginning, I think, or not in the way it's thought of now. And so we formed something called, I think it was the Collaboration Committee that was two members of the school committee and representatives from each of the school councils could get together and meet with the school committee. And it, it kind of just didn't happen very often. Sort of, it was even less effective than the conference committee where we meet with the city council. So it was just like we were appointing people to a committee that didn't do anything. So we've gotten rid of the collaboration committee and so I think we got rid of the language saying that we would absolutely meet with them but I think if the school councils individually or uh, uh, jointly came to the school committee and said we would like to meet with you I think we would either put them on the agenda or we would have a special public forum where we would meet with them if they had an issue that warranted our attention well, that's what we should have as forums Ms. Deckard. I would just like to say that school councils aren't people aren't paid to be on school councils and I would really hate to make all of these things, I don't know if mandatory is the right word, or even recommended or suggested, if, uh, suggested um, to make people not want to be on school councils. Right. So I think that we, we should be careful of that. Mm -hmm. I think it, the ideas are great, but I think we should keep that in mind. Yeah. Ms. Ms. Hennessy? I was going to say exactly the same thing around the support expectation. Like if. I know that these parents on these councils are overworked, and if we start saying, take minutes, post them, do this. But they have to. They, they take minutes, but I, I know that's extra steps sometimes around, like, get it onto the website. That's for me, like, I, I know that sounds really like the, the, the little needle, the, but I think it needs to come more naturally. Uh, they post, they have them now, I agree, but if we start ham putting out expectations, like you have to do this and this with it. Mm -hmm. I do worry at the level of the, the, mm -hmm. non, the number of people who are volunteering just if we're imposing it. I believe in collaboration and everything, but we need to offer some supports. That's all I'm saying. I've been to the school councils at the different schools, and, and you're welcome to go also and go in and see, but I would totally agree with Ms. Hennessy. What they're doing is pretty awesome. Just to consider, I mean, what we do here, we have a lot of, you know, backup and the superintendent and everything else and direction. They have the principal, but the dedication that comes from those parents and the brain power, I don't know how, but it's just pretty awesome that they do get overwhelmed by how much more and how long the meetings go and everything else. But right, yeah, my only suggestion is that they're taking minutes anyway yeah. and they were disseminating, more people might be interested in what they're doing yeah. and you might get more volunteers. That would not be something we would expect school council members to do. It would be, I mean, they would not, we would not be giving them access to the website to update them. It would be something they'd have to get to the, through their principal would have to up updated or mm -hmm. get it to Angelo or somehow they'd have to yeah I don't know how it could yeah. work or even if yeah. I don't know it was well, just mm -hmm. the principal is the one that is at the meeting and runs the meeting so but not necessarily the one that takes the minutes obviously so maybe they could get it to the principal who would approve it and then they can disseminate that information the principals yeah. know the paid position so tonight is just a first reading so these are the kinds of ideas that you should think about for when it comes up for a vote at our future meeting so um, any other ideas or discussion about this? Yeah, I just wanted to mention another thing that has happened in the past was when budget and property, I believe, didn't budget and property host the school councils? And they, yes. gave, they gave it's just like a hearing or something almost, like where the, each school sort of presented something or other to budget and property um, as, as some sort of a part of 
So the, the budget process. The budget process, I'd say, it was a public thing. It was the school councils, and that. I don't know exactly what its derivation was, whether it was this, the old policy or whether it was just something that was coming up. It was the fact that school councils are responsible for helping the, it, first of all, as Carrie pointed out, being a school council member is kind of a thankless job. They don't get paid and really their position is totally advisory to this principal. They, they carry weight, they, are, they have a big responsibility for representing their entire school community, but they don't, they can't force anything. The school committee can take a vote and if the superintendent doesn't do what we want, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do that for the camera? <laughs> <laughs> but if the, um, if the school council takes a vote and the principal doesn't do exactly what they want, there's no, rec there's no fallout from that. I mean, except that people are unhappy. But I mean, so really it is, a, the, so asking the school council members, you know, to do something, it's, I guess that's my point. <laughs> so I, I've forgotten now what the question was. He was asking about a media well, the question. I was just sort of saying that that's something So yeah, that in the they past. are responsible for yeah. advising the principals on the budget and, and helping to determine which, if you have to make, you know, the bad choice, which one is more important or how do you, which things are more important to your school. Uh, if you have to lose a staff member, how would you want to see that happen? So, and when they had similar concerns, we invited all of the school councils to come to us and say, this is what the effect will be if you cut this thing. This is what the effect will be if you do that thing. So we did have them, we did schedule and invite the school councils to come and represent their schools. And we can always, there's nothing in our policy that precludes our doing that, but it's also, we, I, I agree sort of with Carrie that we shouldn't mandate that they do something. I think we should just encourage them to do it yeah. if it seems like there's a critical mass. But. I think we should just start to work on that just as a cultural change in all of it, encourage Well, so we can debate that again, I guess, with the, the next. Dr. was talking about. At the next meeting, if somebody wants to make the motion, then we'll discuss it at that point. Okay. So can we move on to the next uh, so. policy? The next one is the format for school improvement plans. And um, that's CFDA. And interestingly, our proposed revisions include changing the name of that because format for school improvement plans um, it's the administration feels that it is no longer necessary for us to outline the exact format that they have to follow. It doesn't have to have an introduction and pictures and a summary of what you did last year and so forth and so on. Each school should be able to put together a school improvement plan the way that works for that school. So again, you will see that almost the entire original policy has been zapped out and uh, wording from, I think, a suggested MASC policy, is that correct? Two different, two different policies came together, that's right. Two different policies came together to form this, uh, the recommended new policy that's mostly all in yellow. So. Okay, any, um, any questions about this uh, on first reading? Straightforward. Okay, why don't we move to the social media and electronic communications. Okay. Social media. Um, which is, I guess, it's new name because it used to have the name Facebook and stuff and we actually discussed it and decided that Facebook is daily being <laughs> surpassed by something else and that we can't even predict what the next new thing down the pike will be. So we just made it say social media and electronic communications. And um, this is, we do have a policy right now on authorized use, an authorized user policy for staff. And there is something that students or parents of students sign 
that's in, included in the handbook. But those were both about actual use of um, school internet accounts and the and their you know stuff like that. This is about stuff that could happen outside of what goes on in our schools um, and stuff that is completely outside of an educational environment but needs to be appropriate. And so we're looking to sort of, um, I, I think the, the sentence that says that, the, in fact the very first sentence I think says what we're trying to accomplish here, we believe that educators should model professional, appropriate and respectful digital communication skills. And certainly we hope that students will learn from that and also behave in that same manner. So. So this is, um, in part, I, I think the original impetus from the, for this, we, we drafted a policy a couple of years ago, but it was, it was sent back for some further investigation or something, and it never came to the full school committee for approval. This is, uh, an, this is another attempt. And again, this came, it's a compilation of two separate policies from MASC, I believe, mm -hmm. that we took language from. So, other than that, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I do have a question about okay. it, though. In the first paragraph, it says, the superintendent of school principals will annually educate staff members. And then the last sentence of that paragraph says, the training will give. Is, is it implying a specific training or a general, this training of? So, I imagine the way this will happen is, along with all the rest of the required trainings that have to happen on the first day of school, the principal will hand out the social media policy and say, please read and understand this. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ms. Fallon. I was just not clear on um, part two, letter E. It says teachers will not give out their private cell phone or home phone numbers without prior, prior approval of the district. Is that to parents and students or just students? Uh, I would think that it, it really should be, just should not give out their private telephone numbers. If there's a reason why, if there's a reason why a parent needs to contact a teacher on the teacher's home phone or the teacher's personal cell, um, then I just think they should make the principal aware of that. You can get into tricky situations when right. you're doing home to home communication instead of home to school communication. Mr. Ball. Okay, um, Ryan Road used to, um, the teachers at the elementary school, maybe other schools do, would call, and when they call, they call from their home, and then you have their phone number. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's just, and also, not only that, but I'm thinking of it, um, when I go to the parent-teacher nights at the beginning of the open house, at the beginning of the year, they give out their phone numbers quite often, the, the teachers do, for the parents, and you know, not to get, but so that we can get a hold of them if we have questions, and, and I mean, I have lots of teachers' phone numbers, and not because of this position. I, I think that the better idea would be for teachers to give their school telephone number, or their school email. The, the, they do give their school email, but the problem with the school telephone number is that they don't, you can't, contact them and also most of them do their business I mean they're not going to sit here after school yeah. and when they can go home and make their phone calls right you know I mean I agree but well there there's no prohibition in this policy for teachers calling a parent at their home from their home and you're right that may result in the disclosure of a telephone number what this says is that teachers won't actively be distributing their t home telephone numbers Ms. Hannes. I think that's really tricky because they're. At, I know when I'm calling home, which I usually do at night, that parents are getting my phone number, right. and I. I just think we're in one way we're saying that, again this is going back to this expectations and support. We want uh, the fourth standard is or third standard is family outreach. Right. We, we're demanding our teachers mm -hmm. to contact families. I mean, I'm happy that I get calls mm -hmm. from at five o'clock at night, but they're not calling from school. So I know their numbers. Mm -hmm. um, if we're, st I, I don't want a teacher, a first grade teacher, to start worrying. They don't want to call me at home. Right. I, I really, that's worrisome. I think the student is really clear, um, and there are really clear ways that they would get my cell phone or the teacher's cell phone. But parents, I think, I think this is really tricky, and it's. I, I don't want to give make a rule or say something, and then every teacher starts breaking it, mm -hmm. feeling like. Mm -hmm. 
and they're doing it for the best of the kids and education. I would agree with Ms. Hennessy, um, just on the fact that we're encouraging communication and we are encouraging it back and forth, and also trust. Um, if the teacher felt that they wanted to give out and they had that trust to do that, because there's a lot of different issues. I mean, there's issues where, I mean, you know, maybe we wouldn't want in some of the schools, because, uh, like I can think of that because I was a, a big volunteer over at Ryan Road, and some of the issues that came up actually required the teachers to be calling and, and having the phone number so that the, the parents felt comfortable calling and, and, and talking personal because when you talk about parents that have, um, try not to reveal any information, when you talk about parents that have um, like maybe a lower education, the whole thing is a little bit intimidating to them anyhow. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of education and, and the idea of calling a school for some of the people that I've known is is impossible I and mean, it's not something that they would do and they're very impressed when the teacher calls them there's just a lot of information that the teachers might want to know about you know the kind of day somebody's having if, if a child's of a special need or special behavioral issues and I mean it's not something that's out there tangible it's it's me trying to not release any information because there's more than one and two and three students that I know of of, of personally mm -hmm. Um, Ms. Minnick. I, I, I think some interesting points have been raised, but I'm also still concerned about the appropriateness of it. I, I understand that everybody's got caller ID, so if you can got you, to, you know, if you can it, block your phone, you can, you can block, block it. Yes. Well, why don't we put that in care? You know, <laughs> <block> <laughs> just like well, I, I guess. I, think I guess I, I, I also so though agree with the superintendent. Number. Just as there's a hierarchy. For the school committee, you may, if you have a child in the school, you can call the principal and say, I'm concerned about my student. But if you are calling a school for any other reason related to your school committee service, you just want to find out what programs they have there or what teacher is in charge of this or what, you know, what their lunch schedule is. You really should follow the hierarchy, the protocol that says you contact the superintendent's office and let that person, let someone know that you wish to contact a school so that they are aware because no superintendent wants to think that the school committee people and the principal are talking about him or her behind their back. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's protocol, it's appropriateness, and it's, um, it's just a, a it, it, I know it sounds silly. I see you, the look on your face. It sounds goofy, but it really is the way things should happen. Well, I get invited Just to schools all the time. So are you saying in this case that I should call Dr. Provost? If you have been Dr. invited mm -hmm. by a principal to attend a school for a special event, that's fine. If, if, and I, one might assume that other school committee members have received the same kind of invitation then. Now, oh. But if you are talking, if you are initiating any kind of conversation with the super, with a, someone at a school that's not related to your student, I think that you should be going through the central office. I think that's just appropriate protocol. That's and maybe everybody else here thinks I'm old and out of date and that we don't need to do that anymore. But I think that that's what's that was what I was. That's what I learned. That's what I was taught, and I think it still holds. Right. Um, you say similarly events. So how about when we've been invited by um, the librarian or by people at Northampton High School? Do you think that at that point when we do decide five months down the road to take up on that, we need to go and, and talk to Dr. Provost and stuff? I, I will leave that to your discretion. If well, we've well, been I just, invited. I also understand, um, Lisa, I don't understand. I really just don't understand the, what, what you're trying to say as far as I think that teachers are adults and can figure it out themselves. So I'm not, I, maybe I'm like on another page. I don't get it. I guess what I'm saying is that I believe that there is a protocol for school committee people going into the school and it should be going through the superintendent. And I similarly believe that if a parent wants to contact a teacher, it should be going through the school office. And whether that's calling the principal and saying I need to talk with this teacher or whether the, the school telephone numbers have for each teacher have been published you can contact your teacher directly but the initial contact is going through the school okay and then I suppose if there needs to be an ongoing conversation or if a teacher believes that there's a reason for a parent to have 
his or her home phone number so that that parent can contact him, then maybe they just need to go into the principal's office and say, by the way, I'm giving my phone number to this person because I believe it's important. But under no circumstance should it just like go direct and avoid the principal because someday there may be a court case that requires the principal to come in and testify about why this relationship exists. And I think the principal needs to be informed. Have we asked the teachers how they feel? Completely. As far as being it, the, I don't care the how the teachers feel. I care about what's legal and appropriate. <laughs> but uh, we have some, we have a teacher here who's giving well, her perspective, and she's saying it's important sometimes. Well, no, I have that conversation. I'm, I hear what you're saying, though. I'm saying that not the parent calling me. I'm saying that teachers call parents frequently after school hours, and that's appropriate. And then that's sometimes they saying. expect, okay. and then yeah. sometimes, with, and that's what I, and I'll take it one step further, and sometimes those teachers have expected the parents no. to establish, I know of okay. that, oh, specifically I'll, is what I'm saying. That's not what I was saying, though. I was, what okay. I was saying is, I'm, I need to block my phone, maybe that's what you're saying, but I've got many calls from Northampton Public School teachers, very, I needed those calls, saying, hey, this is how this happened today, or I know I call parents and say, your daughter did great, or you're, I'm concerned about this, and I do it when I know they're going to be home later. So I could block. But I'm, so, not, a, oh, I'm not saying call me back on my cell okay, phone. Okay, so you're not that's saying, what I You're not saying call me back on my cell phone. Teachers. No. You're saying call me back and you leave the school number? or I say, leave a message. I leave a message and say you can contact me at school tomorrow. Here's my email if you have email. Right. Conduct promos. I'm, I'm just pointing out there's nothing in this policy that requires a teacher to take proactive steps to prevent to protect his or her home phone or cell phone. It only says that they shouldn't be widely distributing them as the first point of contact. First point of contact should be the school. And then yeah. the teacher's free to call a parent, right. yes. but shouldn't say, if, you if your child has a problem, here's my home phone number, give me a call. Right. 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 That's all it says. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're... But the question was, initially, <laughs> So should the teacher I think my original question was do you mean to students or do you mean to parents or both like they shouldn't distribute it at all that's I just didn't know if they meant they shouldn't give out their phone number to students which it seems perfectly logical or if it was to parents and then I was like oh I could see how that would be a little bit tougher right okay so did you have something to add to that? No, I was just going to back Miss Hennessy. Being an educator myself, you know, I oftentimes get comments from my principal or from a guidance counselor that a, a phone call home to a parent would be appropriate. And um, many times, because uh, parents are working during the day, picking up the phone at 10 a.m. to call mm -hmm. home doesn't yield the, the, the you know, what the objective was and so you can leave a message and if it's about a student you hope the student doesn't erase the message before the folks get home or you call from your own home mm -hmm. and that leaves me to you know make phone calls in the evening as well on occasion in order to talk to a parent mm -hmm. and the teacher evaluation system now supports um, you know, community involvement and uh, parent uh, teacher involvement that goes beyond um, just a afternoon conference it it, mm -hmm. it, it calls for a, a, a collaboration between parent and teacher and student for its student success and I think that warrants a phone call so if you call and they're not home on the message do you say call me back because I mean I know that getting a hold of a teacher during school is impossible plus they don't have the time uh, more you know, often really than not I would I can reach a parent at home in the evening. If not, I, Just I leave asked your them, number. Yeah, I asked them to call the school or that I would try back another time. So you don't leave your number? No, but I, again, it comes up on caller ID. I, I don't recall many parents calling me back at home because I've requested that they call me the next day at school or that I would call back another time. I've had teachers request me to call them at home because I can't get them at school. That's, I mean, my experience is like totally different. Okay. Well, it'll be different from now on if this policy passes. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? Sure, yeah. We, is this also teachers and coaches? Ah. It does include coaches down coach below. It does below, but when it says teachers will not give their private cell phones without oh, prior text approval. messaging and things of that nature. Okay. I wonder if we should go back through this policy and, and look at it uh, because it in, in terms of staff members as opposed to teachers. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. 
So since it's in the reading, and this is just kind of a, a, a technical question, since it's in the first reading and we have this as an issue and you want to go back and look at it, are you talking about going back and looking at it in rules and policy or do we go back and look at it like you as the chair of rules and policy, look at it and then, I don't know, send it to Dr. P Provost, send it to um, Ms. Hannah and myself? I mean, I don't know. Well, I guess he would have to do that. But what are you talking about as far as how does that happen? I mean. I mean, I, th I think that the thing has come here for a first reading. If somebody says, this, a policy, this policy is totally inappropriate, we think it's ridiculous, and you should just start all over again, then it would go back to Rules and Policy Subcommittee. If the concerns with it are so broad and so numerous, then it would go back to Rules and Policy. If it's a simple matter of someone saying, I think we should go through here and change the word teacher to staff person, throughout the policy, that could be an amendment at our, and when the policy is being voted. So I mean, I think. I, I know you don't care what the teachers think about it, but um, going back to, do you think that it would, um, that we could ask them in some way if, if it would create um, undue hardships to, to not be able to say, just call me back? I mean, I just think, I mean, I don't know why, but years ago, that's, they just called and they leave messages and call me back and, you know, I, and such and such a time is convenient for me. I think we've heard from two teachers who said that they believed it was appropriate if you don't reach someone to leave a message saying, I was trying to reach you, please contact me via email if you have it, otherwise you can try and reach me tomorrow at school and leave a message. I think that it's, I think that probably covers it, and I think that the policy, I, I'm, I don't know how you would go about getting the reaction of teachers. Okay, well, so I'm I, guessing I'm not going to just conduct a survey in the next month. Okay. I'm not going to ask the association to go out and conduct a survey oh, no. or have a meeting and get a vote. And I'm going to go back to what I said before. I think what we're trying to do here is craft policy that needs to meet some kind of legal muster. I mean, I think we are trying to create a situation that protects all of our staff as well as the security of our students. And this is not so much, it, it, interestingly, this policy, somebody has focused on telephone calls. This policy was really about electronic communication right. and social media, and obviously telephones are a means of communicating social Socially, right. but and right. electronically, perhaps. But another concern, going back to the electronic, is is without the email me tomorrow. The people that I'm talking about didn't have computers. I understand that. So call the school. Anne and says she leaves a message that says, "Please call me tomorrow at school and leave a message for me, or if you have email, you can email me." And I I. I understand that there are some people, even in this day and age, who do not have email. Now, I realize that most people have a smartphone, but I'm not going to say all of them do. So if you aren't able, then you call the school. And then Anne goes home that night and makes a second attempt. Hopefully in your mess, if you, you've said, I will be home during these hours, or you can reach me at this time, or you can call me during my lunch hour at work, or whatever it is. So she'll make an effort to try and return the person's call at the time they said. I, I just think that this is not about what teachers think is convenient. We're in a position to make some, we're making a policy for the schools. So and I don't think it's about what's convenient for others. I think it's what we believe to be the most appropriate and so but I just want to make sure that the notion's communication is, is what I'm worried about. So once, let's say we do pass this policy, then it would be the step to send out a letter to all the parents stating we passed this policy, so don't take it personally that the teacher, I mean, not like so broad, but that, that they're not giving you the number anymore, but this is the new protocol. I mean, just so I that they know. About, I, I, don't I, think from what, I don't think that's I happening. Know People were, maybe they gave or their fine. numbers to you. I don't know. I've never had a teacher call me and say, here's my home phone number, call me back. I well, just, not only me, but the woman that I know of that was very poor and didn't have a computer and she had the number whose daughter had a lot of problems. I think if a teacher makes that friend. kind of an exception, I said before, if a teacher feels a need to make that exception, they should just notify the principal in their building what's happening so that we have a, pa a paper trail, if you will. But not the superintendent. Not an electronic trail, but we have some kind of, of, of knowledge of what's going on so that they know that there is a communication happening. Right, so where it says 
without prior approval of the district. We're not talking about the superintendent. The principal can be the district. Yes, the principal can be the district. The principal should be the district for this. <laughs> yes, Mr. Moore. I have three comments. <laughs> First one is just a just a wordsmithing one. I think item number two says imp begins improper fraternization, and then it is followed by a number of points A, B, C, D, which all are examples of proper contact. Mm. And so I think really probably the right thing to do would just be to change that from improper fraternization to, you know, proper fraternization. No pro proper contact, mm -hmm. because that's what that category <laughs> is. That'll be simple. Um, then number two, uh, regarding so the dispute here, we were, all this telephone conversation conversation <laughs> has really been about the number B, which says that all contacts have to be using the district's devices. All e contacts. Well, yeah. But it says telephone systems. Right, using that was using the district's telephone system as opposed to using your own cell phone, right. and and I think that is a, that maybe should be addressed in this policy. To, to, Make it because otherwise you're in violation as soon as you do the thing where you call from home. Yeah. Right. Okay. So maybe we want to make add another sentence or something to that piece of the policy because I think regardless of Wait, blocking what? your number or not, it seems like it's a good thing to allow mm -hmm. people to use mm -hmm. their own phone. It says blocked time. call. I don't answer. Students, you don't want to teach your classes. Well, <laughs> at all, well, right? well, no, but no, well, no. well, actually, sometimes <laughs> it does happen because, for example, when you for, at the athletics example is the really good one mm -hmm. where a practice has gotten changed or something and so there's a call goes out and you know oftentimes it's the coach calls the captains and then the captains make all the phone calls but nonetheless the coach called a captain mm -hmm. and you and know and, and it may be happening on the weekend it may not be really feasible to be doing it through school devices is all I'm saying and so you might want to create some language that allows for this to happen Mm -hmm. um, without making that be as long as the rule, coach you know, called the captains and it goes out that's fine it's just if the player calls yes. the coach which they do I hate coach I'm not going to be there which they do for that very reason right okay. no what he's saying on this is that, that it has to go through the district's telephone Devices. system so you couldn't call from the cell phone call the captain can I make a suggestion right. that this goes back to rules and policies <laughs> No, but, uh, but I mean, well, I it has not, to come I'm out of rules and policy. It's been there forever. I'm not <laughs> saying that these aren't good valid discussions. I'm just saying yeah. this belongs in the subcommittee, not here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, it wasn't a subcommittee, and it's been in the subcommittee a long time ago, and then we never got it passed because board. it had that problem. So now we need to, it, I mean, it can go back, but we need to hear all of this so it can go. So did you, the direction. committee not recommend this policy out? Mm -mm. It didn't recommend well, it out. It, it might have, but it never got passed. But what I'm saying is, did this? Oh, did you yes, not this, recommend this out yes, we did. last time? We did. And did you? What was the vote? To there was no vote. It was unanimous. Was raising your hand. <laughs> yeah. The, what? Well, you had what to have done the some. There had to have been some step taken in the subcommittee to send what this forward Duval to us. What Mr. Duval said is that there was a policy that this has been hanging around for a long time. Okay. Two years ago, it was created. I don't know who created it. Maybe it was just as Angela was coming and it was written. I don't know what the disposition of it. She's gone back and looked at all of the minutes and she can find no place where the policy was voted, recommended, or brought to the school committee. Okay. I think it was brought so to the school committee, but had a lot of problems. Well, so that's one yeah. person's opinion. I think that what happened possibly is that in discussion in rules and policy, since there's no record of it being voted as a recommendation from rules and policy, or at least no minutes that she can find, I'm guessing that it was given back to Angelo for further drafting or something. And so okay. I, I, I don't know what to say, but it just it went away. It, so it hasn't been like on the front burner in rules and policy for two years. It kind of went into la la land for two years. And now it, because we've because received issues. a need, we, the superintendent has brought it to us and said that he would like to have a policy. So, and he used two MASC suggested policies to draft this one. Okay. And, and my concern when I first read it was, this sounds so negative. It says improper, yeah. invalid, yeah. infraction, in yes. whatever. And I said, can we turn that on its head and make it more positive? So I absolutely agreed with that. Was, that was what my fist pump was when you said that. Oh, well, you're just mad. No, you said you had a third I, thing. I would just like to direct everyone's attention. I can't even remember where I saw it, 
but there are a lot of um, legal actions pending c dealing with this issue directly with students calling teachers um, and there being inappropriate contact between teachers and students. So um, I think that we all maybe need to look at what's going on legally speaking and and why this policy is important and why we need to protect our teachers. And that's really what this is about. Well, I agree with the teachers and students. I mean, that makes sense. But the teachers and parents, that's the part that that's I think we need to look at it through that lens, though, the, the entire thing. So you should so get a third one. Third one. Sure. <laughs> more. My third point is really a point of information. It was spurred by um, some discussion about, you know, what, what's the appropriate way to be contacting people in the school if you're on the school committee. And uh, I just wanted to make the point that um, 930 CMR 6.03 Section 4 requires that if you're on the school committee and you should advocate um, for a child, so particularly for your own child, um, with any, of, any employee of the district, that you need to file a uh, disclosure form with the city clerk. And there's a form you can get. Um, I think I got this off of DSE's website. Um, or maybe I got it from the Attorney General's website, the Ethics Division. But anyway, it's a form. And, um, and it's pretty simple. You, you know, your name, your position, um, and uh, sort of who you who you met with and why you met with them. So um, in my context, it's been with, uh, I know about it because of you know team meetings, IEP meetings. So advocating for your child is, goes beyond having exactly. a parent-teacher conference. Exactly. Right, so regarding your so it wouldn't be like when you, so it wouldn't be if you're in the school going to a play. It wouldn't be if you're in the school going to, you know. Um, Volunteering in your child's class. You know, open house. It wouldn't be for any of those things. It would be if you called up a teacher to advocate for your student, which parents do, um, and it could be for something perfectly innocuous. You know, you're saying, "Oh, please extend the deadline for this thing," for you because here's what happened: we went to the funeral last week, and you know. Um, but that would be a contact with an employee of the district that you're advocating for your student, and there's this state requirement that you file a disclosure form with the city clerk. That we as a school committee member. That's any school committee member has to do that. Okay. And it, it's actually any supervisory school employee. So, and we count as a supervisory school employee for everybody in the district. So Dr. Provost counts as a supervisory school employee for not us, but for everybody downstream and so on. And so does the ALT then. Exactly. Okay. Ms. Uh, Fallon. You know, I'm reading, reading it, reading it. I move to accept it as is. I actually am completely fine with the policy. <laughs> I'm not kidding. We're not voting tonight. We're not voting tonight. But I'm, <laughs> first reading. Oh, yeah. Okay. Then. But I'm like, honestly, I, I think it's well done. I think it covered, despite the improper fraternization, if you read it <laughs> the right way, yeah. it actually makes perfect sense. You start this. Was all. <laughs> I have a simple question. I don't know what you happened. Started. <laughs> about phone numbers. <laughs> yes, it's both. Yeah. It's both, Laura. It's both. <laughs> so can we get this policy the answer. from Mass? <laughs> oh, no. Yes. We got this entire policy. It's as a combination is. of two policies because the policy that had been through rules and policy before but never voted on the school committee was also a combination of policies. Okay. So, where do we want to leave this tonight? We're not supposed to vote on it tonight, but is there is there a um, are we comfortable just counting this as a first reading, walking away from it for a little while? Uh, I am because then, if we have then, amendments, oh, yeah. it'll sure. be a lot of time to Excellent. come up with them or whatever. Okay, you know? so that sounds cool. I guess I think also that if we come back next time and we can't figure it out. She's right. It, this is if it's too if it's yeah. too broad or too in depth, right. it should be going back to the sure. committee. But I think we'll see that then. If the if the amendments are quick and easy and straightforward, we can do it. If not, then we'll right. vote to send it back to committee then. Let's move on to the graduation requirements for JFK. Yeah. Graduation requirements. Oh, high school. Oh, high school. Sorry. Sorry. I saw the IKF. And it was, uh, <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, wow. Yeah. All right. So. Um, 
This policy is being revised um, in large part because we had a policy and we weren't doing what our policy said. And we have made changes to our curriculum already, so it's advisable that we have our policy match what we actually do. So, and then the other big changes are happening to reflect the recommendations of the um, PE sub ad hoc PE subcommittee, physical education subcommittee that Brian Labardi reported on earlier. This now shows the wellness classes as proposed by that committee. So. Okay, any discussion of this one? Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, rules and policy, that was excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for all your work. Okay, so now we'll move on. Now we will move on to the business administrator's report. And I believe Dr. Provost will be um, providing that this evening. Yes, um, I will limit my comments just to reading in the memo from Ms. Walzak to the record dated May 4th, 2015, number one. FY15 appropriation report enclosed as a monthly expenditure report on the local budget appropriation. There are accounts in deficit, as we have seen each month, but the overall budget is in good standing. I expect to bring some budget transfers to you in June to cover some of the larger deficits, such as utilities, where we are moving expenses from school choice into the local budget for easier comparability going forward, and retirement costs, which are new to our budget this year. Two, school choice, I reported back in January that we are charging $201,324 in special ed tuitions into the school choice revolving account for four students who are choiced in students we, that we receive monies for and whom we will pay and for whom we pay out of district tuition special ed bills. Currently, we are up to five students for a total estimated tuition of one, uh, 301, 352000 I'm sorry, $301,352. Although this is a substantial increase, we do re expect to receive higher reimbursement in FY16 because of these higher costs. That is because you get a dollar for dollar reimbursement for any special ed students through the Choice Program. And that is the financial report. Can I ask a silly question? Mm -hmm. Is there any way the financial reports that come through the number reports can be right side up? Because <laughs> I don't know how to flip my <laughs> Yeah, but then it's like, mean it your electronic. But then if I don't have the computer, <laughs> it's smarty pants. <laughs> it's sideways. <laughs> okay. But I, I really, I tried or just show me how to flip it. Mm. Yeah. Flip Maybe it we could have a tutorial on how to work. Yeah. Our I know it's silly, but. No, 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 I understand. I see it. Yeah. Okay. You. And you have to do it page by page. Rotate. Okay, so now we'll move on to a, a vote. Uh, this is to approve participation in the TIPS Purchasing Collaborative, and I'll ask Dr. Provost to explain that. Sure, the TIPS Purchasing Collaborative is a na national um, collaborative purchasing program. A number of districts belong to it. The um, specific purpose for joining the a recommendation to join the TIPS at this time would be to get a more competitive price for some of the equipment for our buses. It doesn't have a non-compete. Um, it won't affect our ability to do anything else except purchase some bus equipment through this collaborative. And it's free. There's no, free. There's no membership no. or anything like yeah. that to join. I'd like to make a motion to approve the participation in the TIPS Purchasing Collaborative. Second. Okay. Ms. Minnick, do you? No. Okay. Scratch. Right. Okay, so all those in favor of, um, of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so we are now part of the collaborative for TIPS purchasing. Next, personnel report. In your packets, you'll see that we had three new hires in April and five substitutes, five new substitutes added to our ranks in April. We had two separations, no retirements, and one promotion transfer. Um, of Lisa Clock from JFK to Leeds. Okay, and now the superintendent report. Okay. On Monday, April 13th, I facilitated a parent math night here at JFK Middle School. A uh, standing room only crowd that included some of our committee members had a respectful and productive conversation about the many changes to the math program that have taken place over the past several years. The slides shared in that evening's presentation are on the district website. 
One of the questions we discussed that evening were how will we measure the impact of the changes? I explained that a key variable for me is whether the changes will enable more students to access the rigorous content available through AP Calculus or Statistics. <coughs> Since this year's freshmen are the first cohort taking the new sequence, it'll be a few year, years before we know that definitively, but 99 of this year's freshmen are on track to take uh, calculus or statistics as juniors. That compares to 74 students in the freshman class of 2013 and 52 students in the class of 2012. Um, based upon registration for next year's classes, 81 of the 99 freshmen who had doubled up in math this year will be continuing a sequence that potentially leads to calculus in, or statistics in the junior year. That compares to 51 students in this year's sophomore class who are still on track and 45 students in the previous sophomore class who took uh, statistics or calculus this year. And based on the course requests for incoming freshmen next year, at least 114 students will be taking double math as freshmen. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's an important indicator of progress um, of that program. One of the messages that came back very strongly um, through our communication that night was the desire to have students provide anonymous feedback to their teachers on the experience in their classes. Um, this will provide an additional dimension to our understanding of the program. Since the math night, the Joint Labor Management Educator Evaluation Committee has met twice specifically to discuss student teacher and feedback, including once this afternoon. Um, a negotiation session has been scheduled between the school committee negotiating subcommittee and NACE for June 9th. If all goes well, we may be able to bring some recommended contract language to the full committee for June. So it is I'm hopeful, it's going to be tight, but I'm hopeful that we will be able to follow through on getting some student feedback for teachers and getting some teacher feedback for administrators. On Monday, April 27th, I gave a talk to the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association on Massachusetts School Finance. Topics covered included the Hancock case, Chapter 70, Circuit Breaker, Charter School, School Choice, and the federal picture. Um, homeless student transportation and our fiscal stability plan. I think it was a successful evening and we'll likely be reprising the talk for Jackson Street School and or via video. Um, on Wednesday, April 29th, I attended the Grinspoon Awards with our winners, Barbara Bitgood, Amareo Pereja, Michelle Subas, and Martha Hopkins. Northampton was well represented filling four tables with current staff, retirees, and family members. And I'm happy to report that we were certainly among the most raucous groups in <laughs> acknowledging our honorees with our patented blue handkerchief wave. Um, also, our annual school choice lottery was held May 5th. We had 120 applicants for 57 available seats, which I guess I just have to comment on. Um, because. We talk a lot about choice in the district and it, it seems kind of sad that we are turning away students for, la or for lack of space at the same time other people are choicing out. Mm -hmm. um, also um, now that the root causes have been identified, we'll be entering the final phase of my entry plan, um, which is the development of a new district improvement plan. We have reserved May 21st, 28th, June 4th, June 15th, and June 22nd from 6.30 to 8 o'clock in the JFK library. I would very much like to have stu two school committee members join us. If you're interested in participating in this work, please let me know. Could you run those dates one more time? Sure. All, all times will be 6.30 to 8 o'clock and all meetings will be in the JFK library. The dates are May 21st and 28th and then June 4th, 15th and 22nd. I would volunteer for that if you needed somebody. And then um, also, I want to report that along with a dozen NPS administrators, I've begun the Sheltered English Immersion Endorsement course. Um, and we're also one of the most raucous groups in that class. <laughs> um, when, we, when we break out into groups, it's sort of the Northampton administrators and then all the rest of the districts. Um, <laughs> 
So our ELL population is one of the fastest growing subgroups, as you all know now, and the teachers who work directly with ELLs are required to obtain the SEI endorsement. So I'm very happy that we have such a large contingent of administrators also getting the endorsement so they can support the teachers in their work. And then finally, I'd like to congratulate the Northampton High School baseball team for being recognized as a finalist in the 2015 MIAA Community Service Award. The players from the Northampton baseball team volunteered to give up their February vacation to run an indoor clinic and camp at a local indoor arena. Over the course of the week, the players worked with over 60 boys and girls coaching, teaching, and helping them to become better athletes. And that's my report. Excellent. Um, I have a question on your report, just a quick question. You said that 120 applicants for 57 available seats. Mm -hmm. Were there any seats available, um, like in, in any grades left, in, you know, are there any seats available, like in, there's one in fourth grade or something like that because of what they did? We have, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question. With 120 applicants, let's say all 120 wanted to be seniors. I mean, not that they would. Oh, no, no, no. Do we have any chairs no, left we, in we, any of the grades? We don't have any seats left in any of the grades. We have waiting lists in okay. every grade, basically, that's open for choice now. Got it. Thank you. Okay, so there's no new business. Um, just want to announce that there's a negotiating subcommittee meeting on June 9th in the principal's conference room. It's here at JFK. There's a school committee meeting on June 11th. Uh, at 7.15 at JFK Community Room, and the Budget Property Subcommittee will meet June 17th at 4 p.m. in the Superintendent's Office. I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstention? The school committee meeting is now adjourned. Jim.